good evening everybody welcome back to msi web series season 3 uh, we are today uh, to, today's web series we are uh, we are associated with the iims uh, we like to thank president of iims and the council for accepting our invitation and collaborating with us and i also like to thank our past president dr sanjeev nair for coordinating this uh, web series along with iims we like to welcome all our members and on on our behalf of our members we like to welcome all the iims members to this web series amit can you please introduce the co-host yeah so good evening everyone uh, welcome and it's a pleasure to introduce uh, the co-hosts on youtube as well as uh, for zoom for this uh, webinar so in youtube we have uh, dr nilesh pagaria from raipur dr nilesh uh, we want to say hi hello everyone welcome for the webinar yeah then we have dr kumaran uh, he is from chennai dr kumaran you want to say hi to everyone vanakkam ellarku yeah vanakkam to all yeah thank you then on zoom we have uh, dr reena uh, rachel john from uh, salem dr reena do you want to say uh, hi to everyone hi hi all looking forward to a great session thank you uh, then we have dr pushkar uh, waknis from pune dr pushkar do you want to say hi to everyone just on your video okay uh, so uh, now i would request dr uh, veera bahu to take over president of aomsi sir please take over good evening everybody it's a great privilege and honor for me to introduce my good friend dear friend professor dr sanjeev nair he did both his bds and mds from trandum dental college it obtained his fellowship from uk he was a past editor and past president of our aomsi and the current vice president elect of the international association of oral and maxillofacial surgeons he is a second person from india to hold that prestigious post his special interests are oral oncology and vascular malformation various very peer reviewed presentations is a great speaker and a great friend on a personal note i studied mds from the same college and i was his junior and he took good care of me thank you sanjeev over to dr sanjeev for an excellent presentation sanjeev sir before you start can we please run the ms web series music please pravin sure thank you sir we request all participants kindly mute yourself and stop your video request all participants kindly mute yourself and stop your video Ravin your screen is not shared still request all participants kindly mute your audio and stop your video Ravin your screen is not shared okay okay uh, sanju sir sanju sir if you can uh, start the start uh, sharing your screen sanju sir i think pravin system got hanged by the, during that process sanju sir please start your lecture thank you sanju we can start your lecture thank you thank you everyone thank you uh, pritam pramod our president uh, Dr. Veerabahu, 
Amit Dhawan, uh, before I go into the details of all, I, all the people I uh, should thank for this uh, opportunity, uh, can I ask uh, Pritam if my screen is shared? Because that was my worry. It, yes, sir. It's, okay. it's, okay. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah. So, thanks for this opportunity. Yeah. And uh, I was really uh, uh, thrilled uh, to be given a, uh, uh, opportunity to present, uh, uh, moderate the work on vascular malformations and vascular anomalies. Uh, let me introduce, and the uh, speakers for today, the panelists for today have been uh, handpicked by me. It has been my, indeed, my privileged to have handpicked some of the uh, best hands in the field of vascular anomalies from around the world. So to start off with, uh, I will introduce uh, Dr. Ethanandan. Dr. Ethanandan, uh, not only a good colleague and friend, he is uh, a senior consultant, oral and maxillofacial surgeon and a skull-based surgeon from the University Hospital Southampton, UK. He's a lead clinician for head and neck cancer and has special interest and has extensively uh, published in the field of vascular anomalies. Welcome, Ethanandan, to the panel. Thank you. We have uh, none other than Dr. Subramanya Mayer. He is no new face to the association because he has uh, been one of our guests for several uh, of our meetings in the past. He is the chief of plastic and reconstructive surgery, a very good friend as well. He is popularly known as Subo Ayer. Uh, he is the chairman in the Department of Plastic Surgery in Amrita Hospital, Kochi. He has held an uh, esteemed post such as the being the past president of uh, the Association of Plastic Surgeons of India and the uh, Foundation of Head and Neck uh, Oncology. He has done path-breaking work in cadaveric hand transplant and also in vascular anomalies. And I'm sure he is uh, here today to share some of his uh, really interesting cases with us. Thank you, Subhu, and welcome to the panel. We have uh, Dr. Srinivas Ramchandra. I'm uh, proud to see him on the panel. He is uh, one of my uh, earliest mentees and uh, a lovely friend. He is uh, currently a very accomplished surgeon, associate professor, University of Nebraska Medical Center, head and neck surgery. He is also uh, attending in the Fred and Pamela Buffett Cancer Center and uh, he has special interest in vascular anomalies and has also uh, published extensively in vascular anomalies. Uh, welcome, Srini. Welcome to the panel. All right, thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, Dr. Srikan Murthy, I hope Dr. Srikan Murthy is uh, uh, connected with us now. He was having some problem with the audio. Anyway, Srikan yet, Murthy sir. is uh, a very, very popular and a very famous uh, interventional radiologist. He's the chief of the Department of uh, radio Diagnosis, Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi. Uh, radio Diagnosis and Interventional Radiology being an uh, integral and uh, adjunctive part of uh, the treatment of vascular anomalies. I am glad to have such an experienced person on board. Dr. Murthy, welcome to the panel. And I hope to uh, get some really good inputs from you regarding uh, the uh, discussion of the cases we have today. So the way I'm going to go about it is uh, basically uh, lay the groundwork or the foundation with the help of the panelists, of course, uh, regarding uh, how uh, the uh, different uh, modalities of treatment and how we manage such uh, cases. So to start off with, um, uh, I'm sure that everybody knows about it, but it would be nice to hear from the panel or a member of the panel what exactly is uh, vascular anomalies? And uh, Subhu, are you on there? Can I? Yeah, I am. I am. Yeah. Come to you. Yeah. yeah. Can I come yeah. to you for that? Yeah. Yeah, sure. See, uh, but, uh, anyway, the, I, I look forward for this exciting um, session because vascular anomalies has been misunderstood and probably mismanaged also. So hopefully we will have a very good idea about uh, how do we manage in this uh, session. So let me, uh, uh, because it's this sentence was important, it is misunderstood. And if you look at it, classification of the ma vascular malformation itself is a bit of a problem. Uh, Mulliken was the one who initially 
came with a great classification where it was one was the part of the uh, part was called hemangioma the other one is vascular malformations and if you have to clearly understand hemangioma is a tumor in fact because it uh, comes from a, you know it expands and then involutes whereas vascular malformation is an anomaly so when you look at the hemangioma it can be capillary it can be port vein all, all uh, subdivisions are there and in the vascular malformations also there are subdivisions based on the the type of the uh, tissue that is present in this malformation it can be an arterial arterial venous uh, uh, it can be a venous it can be lymphangioma type of thing or a mixed one and then came the second cl uh, cl classification uh, by soen in uh, about 7 years later i think uh, it was superficial deep and mixed so that was a more practical way but i would say the mulligan's classification still hold, holds good and uh, so broadly hemangioma versus vascular malformations and depending upon the component uh, involved you can reclassify the vascular malformations into different categories sanjeev thank, thank you so i mean that was a very comprehensive way of uh, telling us what exactly is the difference because it's like you said it's a very confusing terminology um another very confusing thing was always uh, about the classification and um, i actually picked on dr uh, etunandan to uh, elaborate on that because he has a path breaking uh, article uh, which was published in the british journal of oral and maxillofacial surgery i forget the year but uh, he'll tell us more about it so etu can you uh, elaborate on how we actually classify the relevant classifications that we hold on to today when we describe uh, vascular anomalies thank you uh, I, i think the the review which i had done was in 2006 and so uh, as it has been already alluded to there's a lot of misconceptions and misappropriation of these vascular lesions and most of the descriptions in the past have been descriptive terminology so you would talk about a uh, salmon patch or, or a devil's case uh, or a port wine stain and mulliken and glowacki in 1982 classified them as hemangiomas and vascular malformations and as subu had said hemangiomas hemangiomas are tumors whereas vascular malformations are abnormalities in development so the initial classification that we had put across was hemangiomas and then you describe them depending upon the depth the superficial deep or compound and what you can see within brackets were the previous descriptive terminologies which were used and then when you come to vascular malformations then you describe them as simple lesions or compound lesions and then jackson was the one who popularized the flow within these lesions and when you include flow within these lesions then you talk about low flow lesions and high flow lesions so low flow lesions are capillary malformations venous malformations lymphatic malformations and then you have the high flow lesions which are arterial malformations or arteriovenous malformations but with the multidisciplinary approaches as to the management of these lesions Uh, a society was formed uh, trying to try and amalgamate all the diverse classifications and the classification was most frequently followed nowadays is the one described by ISSVA so international society for the study of vascular anomalies so they described these vascular anomalies as vascular tumors and vascular malformations and hemangiomas form part of the vascular tumor and then you have vascular tumors which are benign locally aggressive and malignant tumors and then you have the vascular malformations which are capillary malformations venous malformation arteriovenous malformation and then you have additional classifications which include changes associated with major vessels and malformations associated with anomalies but i think most of what the head and neck team are likely to be involved with will be hemangiomas and the malformations which will be capillary venous malformation and arteriovenous malformations 
So this is a descriptive classification. And then Sanjeev uh, had pu pu published uh, such a little earlier, uh, uh, which he, I'm sure he can talk about in much greater detail about the anatomical implications of managing these lesions. So, it is very difficult as such to treat every venous or every arterial venous malformation just based on the terminology. It's quite important as such you take anatomy into consideration and the classification like this as such gives additional help as such as to how you would manage particular lesions in particular areas. Okay. Thank you, Edu. Yeah, so uh, like uh, Edu said, he has given a a beautiful uh, description of the different classifications which are actually relevant today. And uh, we had added on another classification of our own in which we divided it into five types or a combination of any of these types, uh, which depended upon how we would surgically manage it. And the details of which will be uh, much more clearer to you as we go into the cases for discussion. So once you have classified it and once you have diagnosed it, then of course, you have to uh, uh, resort to confirming what kind of lesion it is. And for that, you would need to have some certain investigative modalities. And uh, I think, uh, I hope Dr. Murthy is, uh, is he connected now? He is, sir. He is. I, I will unmute him. I will unmute him. Okay. So what are the investigative modalities that we actually resort to when we or uh, and when we encounter a patient with a vascular anomaly, do we actually biopsy the patients? So these are two things that we will discuss now. So Dr. Murthy. Uh, sir, I'm trying, I'm just uh, trying to unmute him. Sir. Okay, I will, I will go on to the uh, details of it. So the commonly used uh, techniques for uh, imaging are uh, you, I mean, most of us would like to do an ultrasound to start off with. This ultrasound will tell you the nature of the lesion, whether it is a cystic lesion or whether it is a solid lesion, which itself will give you an inkling or an idea into the, uh, the category of the lesion. Second is uh, Doppler, which will give you the dynamics of the blood flow inside the lesion. So if it's a high flow lesion or a low flow lesion or a combination of both these will be shown by the Doppler. Then of course you have uh, the MRI or the MRA, which is done. And the MRA or the MRI, especially the T2-weighted sequences will be very clear in showing you the entire extent of the lesion in the head and neck space. It yes. also will be able to show you the fat suppressing sequences. Those lesions which so, are close to... Uh, yeah. uh, Sanjeev, Sanjeev, sir, he is, he is inside now. Okay. That is uh, Dr. Murthy, you can ask him. Dr. Dr. Murthy, uh, can I call you Srikant? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Srikant, uh, so we, I was coming to the part where how do we actually uh, uh, zero in on the diagnosis of vascular anomalies? The most important aspect being, of course, imaging. So can you just throw more light on that? Actually, I was uh, listening to you uh, start off the whole thing, and I think you have uh, done most of the work for me. Uh, but primarily, I think... Uh, to go and look at a lesion radiologically without looking, uh, without considering the clinical aspects as to the age of the patient and especially in small children, uh, I think the diagnosis is uh, more or less uh, clinical in terms of how it looks, where it is, and when has it appeared, and that sort of thing. Uh, now, coming to uh, ultrasound and Doppler, let's say in any given case, uh, the primary thing is, like you said, uh, the first thing I would be interested in is just knowing whether there's an arterial component to the whole thing. So uh, looking for, let's say, a low, uh, low pressure arterial, uh, you know, low resistance arterial flow or a arterialized venous return would tell me that uh, this has got an arterial venous component. So if that is not there, I think your major sort of uh, differentiation is already done there. The other thing is how it looks in terms of, is it a multilocular large cyst or small cyst, or it is uh, like um, tortuous venous channels. Now, that sort of thing gives you an idea, you know, whether sometimes it's very obvious that it's, uh, you know, venous malformation. But uh, when you have large cysts with uh, not much flow within it, you may, the confusion is continues to be with between, let's say, um, uh, you know, 
still could be venous or it could be lymphatic. Um, I think I would say that saying that it is likely to a vascular malformation and it does not have arterial inflow is probably the most important uh, information I would give or I would expect on an ultrasound. Now coming to the MR, I think the MR uh, we have to emphasize because most of these uh, patients are young and I wouldn't want to do a CT on these children very frequently. Okay, so uh, from a point of radiation, of course. And I think CT uh, is indicated in these cases primarily when you have sinonasal disease or basal skull and those kind of complicated stuff where you have lesions within bones. Otherwise, for generally truncal and uh, even extremity pro uh, lesions, I think MRI is more than sufficient. And like you rightly said, the T2 really shows what's going on there. But of course, the, even the T1 and other things. See, the information that we get um, in additionally in MR is that exactly where is it and where all is it going? Is it subcutaneous? Is it going into the muscles? Which muscles? Going around the major neurovascular bundles? What are the compartments involved? So I think that is the kind of information that we would like to have an MR. Now, have, putting the uh, ultrasound and the MR together in terms of that there is no arterial inflow and uh, the MR imaging, you fairly have a good idea as to what we are dealing with. I mean, you can say this is likely to be a low flow malformation. The differentiation between uh, lymphatic and venous malformation may be a little difficult sometimes, but uh, uh, you are more or less there. Now, coming to the angiography, uh, we can all, as you know, do angiography on MR also. You have the time result technique, which actually lets you get at least a few phases of how the blood is flowing uh, to the lesion. And um, uh, if you don't have any arterial uh, hypertrophy or anything, you can be you know, confident that this is just a low flow malformation. On the other hand, uh, if it is indeed taking up blood, or rather taking contrast in the delayed phases, it could most likely uh, to be something like a venous malformation or even a, a cavernous uh, angioma, hemangioma. And um, uh, if there is, of course, arterial inflow, uh, you are likely to see a lot of venous return and the MR will not be able to tell you exactly how many arteries are there, how many veins are draining because of its inability to resolve in, by time. So, those sort of situations, obviously, you know, and I'm sure you will have the information in the Doppler itself. So those are the situations where I would say an angiography has to be contemplated. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. Yeah, that was an excellent way. Uh, he uh, explained about uh, what are the specific indications uh, for doing uh, these uh, imaging techniques. So uh, in all cases, I mean, to put it in a just, uh, not all cases require an angiogram or a CT. So MRI being the most popular and the most uh, informative uh, imaging technique after the ultrasound doctor is done. And uh, DSS can be used as restrictively as possible where situations where you need to do uh, endovascular embolization immediately. So you can do a DSA just prior to the endovascular embolization. And uh, uh, coming to the uh, various ways of managing the disease, uh, I think Dr. Srinivas will uh, throw us some light on that. Srini? Thank you, Sanju. So, uh, as uh, we said, there are a few salient points in management of uh, vascular lesions. As Dr. Etu or Dr. Ayer and Dr. Nair said, because they are in a dynamic state of growth, the tumors and the malformations are both completely differently managed or not managed at all and just watched. So the few points which I would like to emphasize from the beginning is no single modality treatment is appropriate for all of them. So it's all customized. So no one treatment fitting all the lesions. And uh, another thing we need to understand is they're not cancerous or they're not oncological resections. So no biopsies are needed many a time. Just a good history of when it developed is the best thing to do. And um, care for airway, because majority of the vascular lesions are uh, in the head and neck region. So I would say care for the airway is predominantly uh, a good thing to start with, if at all they are involved. Ulcerations, 
and uh, like not imaging unnecessarily may also be a good uh, method of management so with these being the salient points i'll come back and tell you that tumors and malformations in many a tumor like congenital hemangiomas or uh, like the rapidly involuting type there is no management required at all so just wait and watch in the other ones you could start off with medical management um like alcohol people have described alcohol historic historically uh, doxycycline bleomycin and all these are medications which i'm mentioning the biggest medication which made a huge historical impact on uh, management of uh, vascular lesions is the beta blocker propranolol and of course corticosteroids too so just to summarize there can be a medical management there can be sclerosing agents which i mentioned about alcohol doxycycline bleomycin the other types of uh, sodium tetradecal uh, sulfate which are all sclerosins other than that there are uh, superficial capillary lesions which can be managed by using lasers lasers or uh, the three generations of uh, photodynamic therapies and uh, then ultimately resection resection in a, a complete way or stage resection or uh, anatomical subunit consider, uh, considered resections are the final uh, surgical modality thank you shrini uh, so shrini has comprehensively told you the different modalities of treatment available and as we go through the cases we have tried to accommodate every single modality of treatment that has been mentioned here and how we have dealt with it so uh, one of the most important things of course is, is how to get uh, vascular control in uh, when you deal with vascular anomalies dr murthy uh, can you tell us uh, the specific indications of embolization and the difference between uh, intralesional and uh, endovascular embolization dr murthy is muted dr murthy you are muted yeah yeah no you get muted you muted so just press once yeah unmute sir, yourself you once yourself, yeah yeah unmute yeah. sir yeah yes sir go ahead sir yes yeah, we can hear you thank yeah, you sure mm. now um, see most of the time uh, when you say uh, embolization i think uh, i mean the first thing that comes to your mind is going through the vessel so such a thing uh, applies primarily uh, when you have an arteriovenous malformation that means you have a vascular access uh, to it uh, now in such a situation let's say you have two arteries and uh, one or more draining veins uh, to a lesion let's say a simple arteriovenous malformation now theoretically can be tackled either in a definitive manner or uh, in a in a staging down procedure can be done by taking a catheter down the artery that's one way of doing it and uh, injecting uh, glue or uh, in in a, in a the, the choice of embolic material in a endovascular embolization would depend on uh, what is the uh, what is the caliber of the shunting vessels so if you if you have large caliber shunting vessels you may need to use glue or you may need to use coils and uh, vascular plugs and stuff like that uh, but um, The, the a question of intralesional embolization would come primarily when you don't have a vascular uh, um, you know uh, kind of feed up to it now we can also do an intralesional embolization in cases where there are too many vascular uh, feeders to it and there it is simply not possible to enter every one of them to do this again so or let, let us, that's what the two situations So let us say you have a low flow venous malformation. You would definitely do an intralesional sclerosing there. I don't know whether you want to call it embolization, but um, in, and uh, if you are having, let's say, a kind of very vascular lesion, 
which has got a lot of arterial feeders and then let's say a large venous sac into which everything is draining. I would like to hit the venous sac. So if I can't access it percutaneously, I would go directly into it. That is how I would uh, treat it. Uh, I think uh, if the choice is based on the angio architecture, so let's put it in a very simple terms. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, embolization, like he explained, is uh, either you pass it through the vessel and embolize, or you do directly introduce the embolic agent into the vascular sac. So depending upon the uh, flow nature of the lesion, depending upon available feeders to the lesion, your uh, decision is made. And in some cases, of course, you also uh, can uh, do a vascular control by controlling the feeder vessels to the vessel physically. Uh, this is one example where you're physically actually controlling it without an embolic agent. And you can see that uh, the first one is the vascular blush that is seen before the uh, uh, physical control and the second one is after the physical control there is considerable reduction in the vascular blush which shows that when you actually physically control the blood flow into the lesion you can achieve certain amount of uh, exsanguination of the lesion okay, sometimes so, the same thing you can achieve with a balloon so, yeah that's right so uh, there you are uh, we shall go on to the cases uh, now here we have uh, 18-month-old baby, actually, this was referred to me from, by Dr. Krishnamurti and Dr. Pritham. He, he was referred to them for a cleft. He had a cleft lip and a palate. Uh, he came there with a lesion which was covering one half of the face, this reddish lesion covering one half of the face. It was a small lesion which was about 3.2 centimeter, which was present just after birth. Progressively increased in size to uh, when he presented to me with, at the age of 18 months. And uh, this is how he was uh, when I saw him. So, uh, what can uh, Subhu tell me what comes to his mind when he sees this case? I mean, what is the preliminary diagnosis that you would give for this situation? I, I would uh, think uh, in terms of a uh, uh, some amount of mixed uh, nature is there, but I would presume this to be a, a hemangioma uh, initially. And then uh, maybe in that case, I might, if that is the case, I would uh, just wait. Just wait for, uh, you know, it to in, involute and uh, wait, wait for some time rather than doing anything. Masterly inactivity is the best in case of uh, these lesions. Um, but I think that some mixed element will be there. Those might need a cosmetic or aesthetic correction later on. Any, any other panelists have uh, any opinion about this? Um, one can argue that uh, this particular case, in, in the history you said that it came after birth. Is yeah. that right? That's right. That's right. So that would put it as, you know, scientifically an infantile hemangioma, right? Yeah. Of which there are two types, uh, the rich and the niche. The niche is the non-involuting type. So I, I'm tempted to think of something like that, like an NICH in this case. Uh, Sanjay, can I say okay, something? Two. Yeah, yeah. Please. two. So uh, I think uh, as Strini had briefly mentioned previously, Sanjay, I think quite a lot of the diagnosis of vascular malformations and hemangiomas can be made on an excellent history or a detailed history. So in this case, you said that it appeared soon after birth, it wasn't present at birth. And that's quite important because most vascular malformations appear at birth and not after birth. Most, but not necessarily yeah. all. The next is something which appears soon after birth, but very rapidly progresses in size, it's most likely to be a hemangioma. So hemangiomas typically have four phases. So you have a rapidly proliferative phase. Some people say you have a plateau phase, then you have an involutive phase and an involuted phase. Okay. So if you have something which is quite small, rapidly progresses within the first year, it's most likely to be a hemangioma. Vascular malformations are present at birth and they very slowly grow throughout your life. They 
hardly involute. So if there is going to be any event out of involution, or if there is going to be rapid progression in growth, it's likely to be a hemangioma. Then you make a distinction as to what type of hemangioma it is going to be. And typically, hemangiomas are classified as focal, multifocal, or segmental. So as far as this particular patient is concerned, if you say it is quite small to start off with, and it's become very large, and it's quite a significant size, you will be talking in terms of a segmental hemangioma. If Thank you, you were to, two seconds. Sorry. If you yeah. were to look at this case as a spot diagnosis, it's very easy to think of it being a Struve Weber type capillary malformation because it's usually just on one side of the face. But if you look closely at the patient, you can see there is a cleft and there is involvement on the other side. But more importantly, when you look at the ear, there is involvement of the ear, which is outside the distribution of the trigeminal nerve. So taking into account that appeared soon after birth, rapidly increased in size, non-neuronal distribution, you will be thinking in terms of a segmental hemangioma. And the important thing is if you're thinking about a segmental hemangioma, they are likely to be associated with other structural abnormalities. And you will certainly want to exclude any other structural abnormalities, particularly faces type syndromes before you elect to, to treat these patients. Thank you, Andrew. So, so the uh, reason for actually going ahead and doing an imaging in this kind of situation would be to uh, exclude uh, the presence of any uh, syndrome which would preclude your actual uh, treatment protocol of this patient. If um, I agree that uh, the entire panelists, all the panelists have been uh, agreeable on the fact that this looks like uh, infantile hemangioma. And uh, Subhu mentioned about uh, benign neglect, which is a term that is used for situations where you actually allow to watch and grow, and then uh, most of hemangiomas tend to involute. However, some situations you tend to intervene, and one of the situations is when they actually show aggressive growth, as uh, Dr. Etranda was mentioning, aggressive growth in the first year. And in this case, if you look carefully, you can also appreciate the presence of uh, crusting and ulceration both uh, in the re in the uh, within the ear, external ear, and uh, in the near the nasal region. So the, these are situations where you would tend to actually treat it to get uh, uh, relief for the patient. And uh, the most ideal treatment would be medical management. Medical management in this situation was uh, administration of after cardiac uh, monitoring, administration of propranolol, two milligram per kilogram body weight in divided doses over a period of, uh, it's usually given over a period of six months, but you look for the response within the first few months. If within the first couple of months you do not see any response, then you obviously uh, should discontinue the treatment. But in this patient, we did uh, use, uh, uh, along with uh, propranolol, we used a steroid as well. And uh, as you can see, this was the uh, result. So uh, within three months, the patient had uh, the uh, almost 90% of the lesion disappearing from the side of the face. So that is how remarkable the use of propranolol can be. Now, is there, are there any drugs apart from propranolol that are used? Uh, any other beta blockers that have been tried uh, that you know of? Timolol uh, uh, is used. Timolol, yeah. Timolol half the strength and you can use it as a topical. But uh, propranolol or timolol, uh, the huge uh, uh, concern is bradycardia, hypokalemia. And if you're using a steroid and a beta blocker, uh, you should be fairly careful not to use them at the same time together because there is a concern that they may mask hypoglycemia in these patients. So they have actually started using nadalol as well because some of the side effects of uh, propranolol are avoided by the use of uh, nadalol. So nadalol trials are going on with the use of nadalol as well. And um, uh, I believe uh, especially sleep disturbances that are seen with the use of propranolol is not seen with nadalol. So that is uh, about the first case. Uh, anybody, anybody in the panelists uh, have any other uh, uh, queries or uh, suggestions? Uh, 
in other than the anus I mean which is the perianal area the highest ulceration is in the periocular and the neck regions so management other than uh, as you emphasized managing the yeah. ulceration would be nice you can use topical steroids for the man right. management of the uh, topical ulcerations yes so uh, this patient was then sent for the correction of his cleft and uh, has been fine after that uh, does the uh, to the uh, co-host do do they have any questions from the audience yes there are a couple of questions uh, if i can ask them yeah please please uh, the first question is how do you decide whether you choose an mra or an mri mm. and the second question is that how early can the endovascular or the intralesional embolization be done prior to surgery so the first question i will uh, direct it to dr srikant Srikant, uh, yeah, sure. the choice of MRA over MRI. I think this is the uh, basically some kind of a, uh, I won't call it a misconception. I think this needs a little bit of education in the sense an MRI com compasses encompasses everything. When you ask for an MRI in a patient with uh, a vascular malformation of any kind, it will include or it should include an MRI. So you just give additional contrast because you will have to do a contrast scan, right? So you just give the contrast, do the angio, and then the scans that you obtain after that are the contrast study. So there is no such thing as a separate study called MRA. You know? It is just part of the MR package or MR sequences that you do for any vascular. So that is it. Pushkar, what was the second question? Second, uh, question, second was, question was how early, early can, can, yeah how early can we do the embolization before the surgery I what is the time gap again it's a very simple thing actually it's the, it depends on what is the uh, material used for an embolization see if you use let's say something like gel foam uh, to reduce the flow a gel foam you expect to start uh, disintegrating and disappearing within about a week's time it starts so if I were to use gel foam, I'm expecting the surgeon to operate within the same week, surely. If not, the next day. Now, any kind of embolization you do in a mass, a vascular malformation, which is called arterial feeders, you know, we're talking about high flow. The simple dictum is how much ever, even if you do it, what looks like a definitive therapy, you wait long enough, it's going to come back. So you must, when you're doing pre-op, you should actually do it within a few weeks, whatever, uh, whatever may be the situation. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So uh, we we will come to more about the embol emb embolization part because this particular case has uh, no right. role right. for embolization to play. So let us yes, move Sanjeev, on to the next a, case. A last question, Sanjeev. Uh, it's from a, a cleft surgeon. He says, what was the time period between the med medical management and then when did they operate the limb? I think the the patient was taken up uh, for the surgery the month after this patient, uh, after the second picture you see. So it, in about four months time, from the time of presentation, the patient was operated for the cleft. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Thank Dr. you. Thank you. There's a question here. Yeah. Rina. Rina? Yeah. Yes, send me uh, Rina. Yeah, there's a question uh, uh, regarding uh, the imaging. Before imaging, uh, is aspiration necessary to confirm the nature of the lesion? That's a question that has been asked. And there's another question whether there's a role for markers, GLUT1, in differentiating the uh, uh, you know, neoplasm from the yeah. alpha. Yeah, so uh, coming to the first uh, question, uh, the uh, aspiration. I mean, this is not a situation where you would even attempt to put a needle in to aspirate because it's a flattened plaque like lesion. So you're not going to, you're not hoping to draw any uh, aspirate in this situation. And uh, coming to the second uh, question, where GLUT1, yes, GLUT1 staining is usually done post-operatively after you have excised it, in a case where you do a surgical excision to uh, determine the nature of the lesion, but not uh, in a situation like this. Thank you. So we'll move on to uh, the second case. The second case is a young lady uh, with a left uh, swelling in the left preauricular region, first seen when she was 12 years of age, she noticed the swelling. This was soft and reducible in consistency. So, uh, uh, 
uh, Sweeney, can you, uh, I mean, it's soft, reducible, preauricular swelling. So what would you, what are the things that go through your mind when you see this? Sweeney, you're, mu you're muted. So, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry about the muting. And uh, of course, uh, in the region, being in the masset masseteric and the parotid region, I would uh, rule out other differentials of any other uh, neoplastic lesions of the parotid region. Uh, and then a thorough history, as we discussed, again, uh, the fluctuation, how long it's been there, history of trauma, any uh, Pregnancy, sometimes, as we've discussed, pregnancy can fluctuate uh, the lesion uh, and how concerning it is uh, for the patient. So based on this, I would uh, uh, have a treatment protocol or a management pro uh, strategy based on that. Right. Uh, any other panelists want to add anything more? Uh, uh, uh. Uh, within the, uh, the confines of what we are talking about here. So if you're talking about a lesion which is soft, uh, uh, fluctuant, compressible, uh, you would be thinking in terms of uh, uh, lymphatic or uh, lymphovenous malformation. Uh, and if it was going to be an ABA material uh, malformation per se, then obviously you're going to have a bruit or a thrill uh, for a lesion which is going to, going to be quite superficial. Uh, so those will be the things that we'll be thinking of. And given the location of the lesion, the next investigation will be a contrast-enhanced MRI. So there you have an MRI, and it shows clearly the extent of the lesion. Uh, it is... Uh, uh, Dr. Murthy, do you want to briefly tell us what you see here, in the MRI? Help us in interpreting it. I think this is what we're seeing, seeing is a T2-weighted uh, coronal image. Uh, yeah. Uh, it is, uh, I think it can just under the skin, a subcutaneous plane, and uh, extremely bright. So it's obviously uh, indicates that it's just filled with water. In other words, like uh, what was just mentioned, it's uh, either lymphovenous or a lymphatic or a purely venous, uh, you know, slow flow or Shall I say no flow malformation is what I would look at. I mean, good thinking about. Um, yeah, but I would have also already done an ultrasound at this stage, and I would not have seen any arterial inflow, I suppose. So that is also sorted out. So now that we have confirmed it to be a low flow uh, lymphatic or lymphovenous malformation, Subhu, do you have uh, any suggestion on how we will tackle it? First of all, my, um, my am I audible? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I uh, see. First of all, I would uh, look in terms of again the as uh, Srikant said, it's a subcutaneous one. Uh, it will be increasing, and then I would uh, be a bit conservative in a way that surgery would be uh, would not be considered at all uh, because of various reasons at present. I would uh, look in terms of uh, using a sclerosant in this particular case. And then we have to use the material which I use uh, can vary based on what is the institutional practice and what he has been using. We have been using the trade uh, uh, things like uh, esophageal sclerosis. That's why our policy, whatever is available uh, as scleral type of thing. And then uh, I would uh, maybe uh, use it uh, under ultrasound uh, guidance uh, aspirate a bit and then do it and then repeat it a uh, couple of times and then the the duration I mean the frequency of repeti repeating is also variable I think my policy might be different from what Sanjeev uh, does or Yadu does I would uh, I would leave it for about two months and then come back again and look at it rather than uh, quite frequently but I would warn them regarding this is a subcutaneous thing. So I'm a bit worried about the uh, sclerosin going out of hand and then you having a skin ulceration. All those things are a possibility. So you have to be a bit careful when you choose the sclerosin also. Don't over inject. Try to do it uh, limited in stages. 
Yeah, so uh, in, this, in this particular case, of course, we uh, uh, went ahead and uh, did a, a yeah. So in this particular case, we went ahead and uh, under uh, ultrasound guidance did uh, intralesional uh, uh, sclerosant uh, use of uh, injection bleomycin. And uh, like uh, Dr. Subhu was saying, we use ultrasound guidance to uh, identify the locules and then uh, use a three-way syringe to aspirate, one syringe to aspirate and one syringe to actually introduce the bleomycin. Now, bleo we'll come to the complications later, but very briefly, bleomycin having certain complications uh, in Italy, like pulmonary fibrosis, et cetera, you would be careful as to the quantity of uh, bleomycin that you would actually inject into the lesion. Uh, the other ways of uh, doing it is by uh, also using a, a bleomycin in gel form or combining bleomycin with, uh, uh, say, uh, polydocanol foam. So these can reduce the necessity of the amount of bleomycin that can be introduced into the lesion. And uh, this can uh, give fairly good uh, uh, result, as you can see. The patient has uh, completely, the lesion has uh, ablated uh, without any active surgical uh, intervention. Can, can so, you ask uh, Srikanth whether radiologists prefer anything different now? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, Dr. Murthy, Srikanth? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, actually, so, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, um, I think uh, we would do something exactly uh, what you have done for this patient, um, excepting that, you know, like what Dr. Subo says, you can, using local material, so to speak, uh, we, we tend to use sorted to call uh, STS at three person. Right. So that combination we use. And uh, uh, I would be a little concerned that because it's very close to the parotid. I don't want to be, you know, injuring any facial nerve uh, branches. Branches, yeah. yeah. That is one thing. Uh, but of course, I'm not going to see those branches. So we would be, uh, you know, I would go easy on the deeper part at least and uh, stage it. I think you have got a wonderful job, finished it off in one stage, but uh, maybe give her two sittings. Uh, that would be what I would. Yeah, we, we actually did two sittings, uh, three oh. sittings in this. Oh, right. So it is, yeah, it is after three sittings that we achieved that result. But progressively, like we said, we control the uh, dosage of uh, bleomycin that we inject. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's important. Yeah. And uh, yes, uh, so uh, this is case number two. Uh, yes, Sanjeev. I think, yeah, tell me. Uh, could I ask Srikanth a couple of questions? Sure, please. Okay. Uh, Srikanth, uh, so based on the MRI, are there any features that you can pick out as such to say this more likely to be a, a lymphatic malformation rather than a venous malformation or vice versa? Um, I would look to the contrast scan, which is not provided. Uh, if I don't see an iota of enhancement in the whole thing, I would put it as a cystic hygroma, uh, you know, a kind of lymphangioma or whatever you want to call it. But if I do see enhancement in delayed phases, um, I would, at least parts of it, I think a venous malformation would enhance at some point. Uh, but if I don't see an enhancement, I would put it as a lymphatic. Otherwise, it, it is, if it's a large space, uh, there is a very little you know, to differentiate the two. Okay. Uh, thanks. So, yeah, so we move on to uh, the third case. This is a 34-year-old uh, male patient. Uh, obvious swelling of the left temporal orbital region. He had severe pain and throbbing sensation, which was on and off. Again, started uh, when he was uh, age of 20 with slow increase in size. Clinically, uh, the appearance is uh, obviously presence of orbital dystopia without diplopia. Now, interestingly, uh, diplopia are no, not necessarily present because it has accommodated uh, being a gradually increasing lesion. Soft and reducible, the soft tissue part is soft and reducible in the temporal region. So, uh, Dr. Murthy, at this situation, what kind of uh, image should we actually ask for when we send the patient to uh, uh, what would, kind of image would give us the best information? Um, 
I don't want to be pedantic and say that you will do an ultrasound again in this, although you could do it, give you information. But I would go straight for an MR because it is an orbital thing and I would also be very much interested in knowing whether it's something coming from inside. So I think a complete study, I would do an MR. But I may also want, it's, uh, at the end of the MR, maybe I may need a few sections on CT at least. And even, even if they are playing scans to see how much of bony involvement is there. So that would be the way I would go. Yeah, so I mean, in fact, Dr. Murthy mentioned that he wouldn't want to be pedantic by saying uh, ultrasound, but we routinely do ultrasound for all these patients prior to sending them for a definitive uh, imaging modality. Yeah. yeah, so we do that routinely. So it is, uh, you know, you're more than justified in saying that. And in this particular situation, we have actually uh, done a CT uh, with contrast. And uh, the CT with contrast, that is this image, uh, shows the dilated uh, superior ophthalmic vein and uh, structures around it in the intraorbital part of the uh, lesion, and also some amount of fibro fatty thickening in the subtemporal part. Now, this is how the lesion appeared. So, uh, uh, Dr. Eto, uh, I mean, how would you uh, proceed with a situation like this? Obviously, it's symptomatic. Functionally and cosmetically. Yeah, true. Uh, and so the so the decision here is most likely to be a venous malformation or possibly a lymphovenous malformation, and it's mm -hmm. multi compartment. I think uh, that's quite going to be as you say quite important as I say. There's an intraocular element, there's a temporal element, and uh, I'm not sure based on this as to whether there is an intracranial element uh, as well. And we know that with malformations, especially with lymphatic uh, arteriovenous or venous malformations, there's likely to be additional bony involvement, uh, which is more frequent. So we'll have to think about whether uh, anything is going to be done or requires to be done regarding the bone. So that will be as far as your assessment is concerned. As far as how are you going to manage that, as you say, it's a significant cosmetic deformity there is likely to be ongoing proptosis, that there can be problems with the eye. So as far as his eye is concerned, so that is another critical thing that one will have to be thinking of as such, and with the discomfort associated with that. I will certainly speak to our radiologist as such to find out as to whether there will be something for which they can apply some intralesional uh, agents to decrease the amount of, of bleeding, which is likely to occur intraoperatively. Uh, and that's something that we'll have to think about quite carefully. Uh, and then it will be a, a, a combined craniofacial resection. Subhu or Srini, do you all have any uh, difference of uh, any different uh, thought about it? Can I add a small point to the history or uh, early lesions and a question to Dr. Murthy, Dr. Ayer? So occasionally these uh, orbital lesions, the patient describes when they are sleeping, they have uh, this swelling of the eye. And then when they get up or they sit down or uh, walk during the day, the swelling of the eye goes down. Or there is an occasional um, um, low flow lesions which have been mentioned in uh, literature which talk about an acute phase that means the there is a thrombotic event in the varices which happens so then the patient presents with an acute swelling cellulitis sort of a picture and uh, so dr murthy in such situations do you ever have done like a prone position or is it indicated for a prone position ultrasound or a imaging scan at that time um, I must admit that, uh, or rather, I have I have seen one or two orbital venous varics, which is what you're talking about, uh, which tend to uh, manifest in fairly uh, younger people. Actually. I have seen it in, in fact, uh, one of the infants, and one of them we actually went ahead and did a sclerosin therapy with a very good effect. Um, 
I am aware that they can thrombose and produce acute, you know, present acutely, but I don't have any experience with the uh, case. Uh, neither have I done uh, positional change uh, imaging in such a situation. But of course, we do get to see a lot of uh, cavernous sinus involvement. That's why I said uh, imaging is necessary. But we need to know. Uh, see, just what you see here is a very, very large dilated vein. Uh, yeah. We have no idea based on this whether the vascular supply is coming from inside or outside the brain. So, so yeah, interesting, Murthy. Dr. Yeah. Murthy says that. So what uh, we went ahead and did was uh, we did a intravascular uh, uh, injection of uh, uh, cyanoacrylate to actually uh, coagulate the lesion. And following that, so uh, first we did a, a cyanoacrylate uh, coagulation of the lesion. So intralesional uh, sterosin was injected. And subsequent to that, we actually repeated a angiogram to see if there was any additional feeders which were uh, supplying the lesion before we uh, surgically intervened to remove the lesion. And uh, then the lesion do, using an orbitotomy and a frontal orbitotomy and uh, uh, fr uh, the fr uh, frontal craniotomy and orbitotomy, the lesion was uh, completely excised. And this is the same patient after uh, about, uh, uh, I think, six months. So you can see that there is gradual correction of his orbital dystopia. Now, interestingly, somebody had mentioned about, uh, uh, I think Dr. Murthy was asking about uh, imaging for uh, locating if there were any additional lesions. Now this patient had small multiple uh, AVMs uh, in his uh, intracranial positions in different areas of his brain, but uh, which were not, uh, you know, when we took a neurosurgical consultation, they said it could be well left alone. So we, at that point, the only symptomatic part being the orbit and the eye, we actually dealt with the orbit and the eye. So this is the, so, uh, can, you, can, yes, I ask, uh, can I ask uh, one question? It is mainly to Srikant. Now, yes, cyanocrylate, yes. this thing. See, yeah. when, which or which cases like this? I, I would have been, I, see, Sanjeev, you would have seen much more, more images of this. I would have uh, loved to see all the images before I go into that treatment because you would have de decided, uh, you know, rightly in this case. A yeah. uh, question to uh, uh, Srikant is, uh, what sort of cases you would uh, not uh, inject at all in these cases? You know, in this periorbital areas where you would be worried about a lot of other things to happen. See, um, I, I just ran through that short angio clip and I, uh, I can see that it's an internal maxillary yeah. uh, an injection. Yeah. And... Uh, the so thing is, it is not a question of uh, where you would not inject. But I think it's very obvious now that what the radiologist found was an, uh, was an AVM. And uh, these kind of AVMs, uh, this congenital, I, I, I mean, you can probably call it a congenital. Uh, this one is not an acquired at least. And uh, these are likely to have multiple feeders, both obvious on the angiogram and not so obvious on the angiogram which tend to manifest either immediately after you are done the so-called embolization, or they may come back, out, and when the patient comes back after two, two three months, they all come back. So um, the idea, see, you use glue, uh, try, most of the time you use glue, most of the time you use glue to actually, um, uh, you are looking at a definitive embolization. That means glue is a very permanent material, also very risky to use, uh, but requires experience. Uh, but um, we generally use glue when we are doing a definitive treatment or, or uh, in this case, I guess they must have been forced to use glue because it must have been a fairly big AVM. And the only way to stop the flow or reduce the flow sufficiently was to have been to use glue. Uh, I mentioned angio architecture right in the beginning. I expect that the caliber of shunting vessels in this would have been large and uh, particles would not have sufficed for a pre So I'm just guessing, yeah, but I think that is the way. Uh, this was a question I wanted. What is the caliber of the vessels you would be? Would you choose the material based on the venous outflow caliber? How do you measure that? How do you, what is your principle on that? No, uh, I wanted to, I mean, I'm forced to sound a little. Uh, 
one scientific uh, you know artisanal uh, here actually it's an eye bowling thing you know that is uh, the whole purpose of the, the super selective angio here is to see how fast the contrast is transiting from the arterial to the venous side if it is happening very quickly you know by the time i finish and i also we also do a controlled injection in the sense that injection we also look at what is the volume that we inject that means we may take let us say a 1 cc or a 2 cc with a micro catheter and see how much we are injecting and see how fast it is going i mean by the time i finish this about a 0.5 cc i am already seeing the vein i know this is going through very fast when i say caliber i mean the 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 speed. let us put it in a very simple way how fast it is going to the other side and uh, so the thing is that if i am committed to glue i would still use glue but then the concentration of the glue would change based on how fast the flow is the reason why for a purely pre op embolization i would not use glue if i can help it is because glue is risky and in an in internal maxillary artery we can expect a lot of unseen uh, connections between the internal maxillary artery and the ophthalmic and why are that with the internal carotid artery it is it is in very uncommon to suddenly find your embolized part of the internal carotid artery that's the point so interestingly dr murthy uh, is there any way in which uh, you can prevent the uh, like dr subhu was saying if it goes into the venous system is there any way that you can prevent it by using say uh, venous filters uh, through stents or anything like that no 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 i don't think it works that just means complicating the procedure immensely and glue the the point about glue is why we need to keep talking about glue is glue is cheap solidifies fast yeah and it's cheap see cheap. Yeah. the alternative to glue which are safer like uh, you know onyx and things like that are very expensive and many right. of our patients what happens is if you were to use sophisticated stuff like that you will end up uh, spending you end up spending whatever the entire budget on that procedure you won't have any money left for surgery so generally you know i personally i don't have any experience at injecting glue in a pre op situation i'm sorry in onyx in a pre op situation okay so um, the glue is cheap so um, the thing about getting it on the venous side is trick is to use the correct volume also see the right concentration and the right volume that is that is the purpose of the test injection with a small amount of contrast to see how much will go on to the venous side right so you have to play with both the dilution which will, which will, and the volume and keeping things on the lower side is what saves the, saves you Sanjeev, I'm sure we talk about it in one of our cases much later. Yeah, uh, but yes, yes. Uh, 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 and then uh, we can elaborate a little more about the onyx and fill that uh, Srikant was talking about. So, do we have any uh, questions about this uh, particular situation or case uh, from the uh, 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 the, the audience? Yes, yes, Sanjeev. Uh, there are many questions from the audience. If you can pick the, uh, uh, you know, the yeah. yes, the most. Are... I'll tell you the most popular ones. The most yes, popular ones is what is your protocol of bleomycin and the time difference. Number two, why not use STD or PTD instead of bleomycin? And for the third case, people wanted to know how do you decide the site of injection and whether there is any concern for retinal vessel occlusion or vision. or the status of vision after surgery yeah i think the uh, the th coming to the third question it's almost been uh, uh, completely uh, discussed by dr murthy the decision is depending upon the caliber of the outflow and how quickly the outflow happens so these are the uh, you know uh, the risks that are there and born in mind when you do it so depending upon the uh, uh, the uh, quickness with which the blood enters into the venous system you would be wary about uh, the quantity and the uh, timing of injection of the uh, sclerosin into the uh, lesion now coming to the first question bleomycin in this case yes, how do you bleomycin. decide the dosage and the time interval so bleomycin when we use bleomycin like in the second case it is 15 international units which is diluted in 5 ml of uh, fresh saline and uh, the duration the intervals is once in 15 days and uh, one more question you have 
the question is uh, why not use injection std or ptd instead of so, so this is this is about the flavor of the surgeon i mean uh, subu okay. uses uh, std and uh, others whereas i use bleomycin so it is what a person is comfortable using and what person has been using over a period of time so i think it's just that there's no uh, it can both std is as effective like subu says in his hands in my hands bleomycin has been but bear in mind both these have got complications nevertheless uh, rina you have any yeah, questions any any landmarks dr sanjeev uh, when you're giving the injection the intra uh, intralegional injection and in, around the orbit for the third case so the, so in this case you do a ct guided injection of the uh, superior of the midway and uh, what is the follow up that's what we want to know and if there was any recurrence uh, follow up is uh, regular follow ups in the first year for every month and the patient is asked to report back if he develops any complications with his vision recurrence no recurrence in the local site but this particular patient had aggravation of a few of his intracranial lesions uh, but the uh, primary site where they, which was operated have was absolutely uh, disease free Dr. Sanjeev, can if I can ask a question from the first case because we missed out on that for the lack sure, of time. Sure, quickly. Can yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, any investigation to know the phase of the uh, hemangioma, whether it is uh, in the proliferative state, uh, phase or the involuting phase? The and best also, investigation is clinical observation. So when you see that it is uh, where the patient says that it has been increasing progressively in. Uh, its uh, dimensions and it's uh, evident that it is a rapidly proliferating phase and how do you decide whether you give uh, a beta blocker with steroids or only uh, uh, any steroid is uh, mostly given restrictively for cases where there is ulceration or there is uh, edema etc but it is not routinely given uh, topical steroids alternatively can be used where there is areas of ulceration Thank so you. we move on to the uh, thank you uh, rina uh, we move move on to the next patient uh, 32 year old uh, female with a uh, large swelling uh, buccal submandibular area uh, pulsatile with bruy on auscultation uh, when she reported she had a hemogram of uh, uh, she had a 6 gram person hemoglobin of 6 gram person with a very low hematocrit Uh, if you she had this uh, opg with her and which you if you uh, carefully observe her left lower quadrant all the dentition were completely uh, mobile and strapped together or splinted with a uh, wire because they were completely loose and there was complete uh, there was a very frequent oozing of uh, blood from the gingival space which had led to the progressive reduction in her hemoglobin and uh, she obviously because both functionally and aesthetically she was uh, requiring some solution to this problem she had to be operated on so uh, what are the investigations that you would think of so um i would uh, think in terms of first the imaging uh, i would do a i in this case i might do a ct with ct angio first okay. rather than mr because i am more worried about the bone here and then um, a dsa will be planned if i am going to uh, it depends upon what what is a vascularity dsa is plus minus because to me i might uh, explore and then look at the feeder vessels and clamp it rather than doing a embolization uh, but that would be the way i would go and then look at the bony involvement and decide uh, the treatment accordingly but the mainstay of the treatment would be surgery Right. Uh, any difference of opinion, uh, Ethu or uh, Sini or Dr. Murthy? Uh, I guess as answer, uh, if we were to see this patient, uh, I'd agree with. So we will ask for a contrast enhanced uh, CT uh, and a CT angiogram as well. And this certainly got some fullness in her cheek, and so there's likely to be an additional soft tissue element. and uh, and we would want to evaluate that further with a contrast enhanced mri so for us we will ask for a contrast enhanced mri contrast enhanced ct and the ct angiogram in the first instance so uh, in this patient we actually went ahead and did a ct angio and uh, this was the uh, appearance 
Dr. Murthy, uh, can you uh, uh, help us interpret the uh, CT? This is uh, this is what I was saying. Actually, when you do an angio, or a CT angio, or an MR angio in a patient who has a, you know one of those type three kind of type three B or uh, that kind of arteriovenous malformation with multiple feeders and multiple venous out, uh, outflows, you get a picture like this, which is basically of no use. You know. It looks very scary, and I think uh, that is really the information that you get out of here. It's a fairly large uh, AV malformation. You better be careful because you cannot distinguish the uh, artery from the vein here. It's just a bag of worms appearance uh, because this imaging uh, does not have the time resolution, the temporal resolution to tell you which is the arterial feeder, which is not. The information. So you would go ahead and do a, a DSA. Um, in the CT, I would be like Dr. Sumunia said, I would be interested in seeing what is happening to the bone and whether there's an additional soft tissue component and all that stuff. But to define the AVM and to know exactly which are the feeders, how many feeders, what kind of control uh, your surgeon can get, where he should clamp, and things, I think a DSA is the correct answer. Yeah. So exactly. So uh, you this, these are situations where you would require a digital subtraction angiography to exactly pinpoint the feeders and uh, so you plan out in such a way that you do a dsa and follow it up uh, with uh, the uh, endovascular uh, embolization and uh, uh, i would ask dr murthy to explain to us this terminology but serial embolization of the different vessels and in this case it would be starting from superior thyroid to the uh, facial lingual to the uh, uh, superficial temporal and the internal maxillary all these uh, have to be uh, serially embolized. The embolic agents that my interventional radiologist used at that time was PVA. And uh, we will come in a moment to Dr. Murthy to ask him the quantum of PVA that probably would be required in such a situation. So we serially uh, uh, embolize so that uh, we can get obliteration of most of the feeders to the vessel. And as you can see in the last uh, exhibited uh, image, there is uh, you know, very good vascular control after the serial embolization. Uh, Dr. Murthy, can you uh, tell us uh, the, uh, what, what, first of all, what, what kind of uh, embolic agent would you prefer in such a situation? Uh, I would do the angio, and I would also see why I'm doing the angio. I mean, in the sense, if I'm just doing the angio so that I can let the surgeon operate within a few days, uh, I would uh, restrict my embolic material to something that is temporary. That is, either I'll use gel foam, which is the cheapest, mm -hmm. or I would use, uh, in fact, I would prefer gel foam if the angio architecture would allow it. That means there are no large fistulae. And uh, I would also consider using PVA, uh, you know, large, because PVA comes in graded size, you know. So something yeah. like in the range of about 300 to 500 microns size, uh, that's half a millimeter or one third of a millimeter size uh, is something that we can use here. Basically, we don't want the stuff we are injecting to end up on the venous side and get to the lung. It's as simple as that. And uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the, you also mentioned that, yes, it looks like just about every branch of the external character may be involved here. The only, it's very easy, you know, I mean, very easy in the sense in you know, conceptually very easy to get into each branch separately and embolize each one. But uh, one important thing which Dr. Sabunia has said is that you can actually get control of the external carotid without much of a problem. So I would not embolize this to stasis because the danger would be in any embolization as a general principle, the closer you get to stasis, the faster you will get the reflex of the embolic material. And before you know, you will have a patient with stroke. So that is the only point I want to highlight here. Okay. So Dr. Murthy has highlighted about what can be the risk of uh, such a embolization. The risk would be a reflux uh, of the uh, embolic material, which would uh, then cause uh, CVA and uh, would uh, be disastrous. So in this, uh, and the other thing was uh, about the timing of surgery. 
preferably within uh, 48 hours of uh, having uh, done the embolization, the patient has to be taken Correct. up for surgical intervention. So otherwise you would uh, you know, end up with getting collaterals in uh, such a high flow uh, scenario. So this patient was then uh, uh, operated on after the embolization. So you use a cervical approach and uh, you curate out the lesion from the entire hemimandible with removal of the lower left quadrant of uh, dentition. And uh, this is the post-operative OPG, which was uh, taken after about a few months. And you can see that uh, it has, uh, you know, the intra-skeletal part of the lesion is completely settled. And uh, this is the intra-oral picture, patient rehabilitated with that denture. And this is the post-op. So uh, as you can see that there is still some residual lesion that is present in the buccal aspect, which uh, uh, because of the uh, morbidity to the fission, uh, we have actually spared and uh, we have uh, not really uh, done anything about it. And I think uh, the entire panel would uh, agree with the uh, modality of management. Of course, uh, uh, Subo, do you uh, uh, visualize a different way of reconstruction in case you have to actually remove the mandibles? So I would, um, I would think I'm, I, uh, I am a bit worried about this case because when you cure it out, unless see that is a good thing about embolization is that you could carry out this uh, cure touch without much problem. If I was clamping the uh, external carotid and then going ahead with the surgery, my cure touch would be a bit of a problem because you could have profuse bleeding from that bone bone area. You know, it is very difficult. Maybe uh, say super embolization would have made that bleeding, chance of bleeding much less. Now, uh, curatage is quite acceptable to me if their bony stock after the curatage is good. Here, I would have been bit, I would have been ready to do a fibula beforehand. I would, I would plan for a fibula also because I'm not sure these, these uh, are deceptive. The images are so deceptive in bone. So you might end up with a large bone defect and you may have to resect it unless, you know, you cannot leave that cavernous things to be there and then start bleeding later on. So mm -hmm. mentally, I would be prepared to do a fibula if needed. But I fully agree to the way you manage. I mean, curatage and leaving the bone. This bone heals very quickly also. They, they are very, they have a good healing potential. So it's not that it should be discarded and uh, totally. So that is the way I would look at it. Yeah, so what Subhu was trying to highlight is uh, there are different ways of actually uh, reconstructing it. One is you can actually cure it out the lesion, but if the lesion, if it proves to be uh, you know, a meddlesome or a messy uh, hemorrhage at the time of cure attack, uh, what really helps is uh, uh, resecting it because resecting will immediately stop the uh, blood flow which comes from the opposite side of the mandible. So the hemimandible can get uh, vasculitis from the opposite side and if you have uh, not actually control the ECA on the opposite side you will get uh, a lot of bleeding if you do not actually resect it or you do not osteotomize the mandible and osteotomizing the mandible and removing it is another way or alternately you can remove the mandible extracorporeally clear out the uh, lesion and refix the mandible, only the mandibular scaffold, which also we have done in several cases with very good uh, results, especially so, in young people. Sanjeev, I just want to add that particular point, emphasis on one point, because me and Pramod were involved in a case and then we were uh, starting to cure it out and the profuse bleeding. We had to resort to the mandibulectomy in about three, four minutes. And then right. we tried to put a plate, it's a child. So that is the way it can bleed. And then what yes. the point, what you said is right. If it is intractable bleeding, the only way is to resect that mandible and then keep it like that. You know, that's a, that's the thing. That's a message. Okay. That you so uh, do we have any questions from the, uh, uh, the uh, viewers? Yes. If so, not, ah, sorry. Yeah. Yes, Dana. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there's a question asking about the time of re, uh, reconstruction if resection is planned in this case, as embolization is done. Does that embolization have a 
uh, play a factor on decision of reconstruction if resection has been planned. Here you have not done resection, but if resection is done. Yeah. yeah. So if resection is done, yeah. I think uh, Subhu will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a very, very yeah. smart <laughs> question, I would say. It's a very smart question. Uh, because you are uh, selectively embolized all the vessels. What do you do? And then you want to reconstruct. That is where you are, uh, if you are reconstructing, you know, the superiority of clamping vessels, right? But I would uh, put it the other way. If I am reconstructing any of these defects, I might do it in a delayed fashion, not on the same day. I might leave it for a few days, uh, three, four days, and then make sure that there's no bleeding. Put a plate and then cover and then come back and do it in a delayed fashion. By that time, I would be able to find the vessels or I would like, like to look at if you find that the embolized, uh, if you have embolized all the vessels and then uh, you are quite worried, I would go to the opposite side and get a vessel. But I would do it in a delayed fashion. Thank you, Dr. Ayer, sir. There's one more question, Dr. Sanji. Can I ask yeah, that? Please. Yeah, uh, yeah. What, what is super selective uh, embolization? I think we have been understood that. Well, uh, I think what uh, Dr. Iyer mentioned uh, meant by super selective is you probably need to do a local embolization of the uh, site as well, apart from embolizing endovascular embolization. So you actually uh, introduce embolic agents into the skeletal uh, structure, which in this case is the mandible. So that will uh, kind of cause uh, some of a reduction in the uh, vascularity within the mandible as well. I'll just add one thing here. The yeah. term super selective embolization is used when you actually uh, go down the uh, vascular tree, you know, into the deeper branches. For example, uh, you go down the uh, common carotid, get to an external carotid, and then take an external carotid branch, the internal maxillary, and take a branch of that. That is when technically it's called a super selective uh, embolization. Just to clarify. Yeah. So, uh, any more questions, Dr. Rina? Yes, uh, a question is, have you ever had extensive skin necrosis after embolization and prior to surgery or after surgery? Uh, interesting question. We have uh, <laughs> uh, a small section on complications, so we will come to that. Okay. Uh, where it where can be pictorially uh, shown to you. What can what could happen if you actually embolize uh, uh, very erratically? So uh, that finishes this case. We'll go on to the next one. This is one of uh, Dr. Srinivas Ramchandra's case. Srini, do you want to tell us about this case? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. So this was a young male so was seen by a dentist. Uh, about to inject some local anesthetic in the buccal side for uh, an extraction of a wisdom tooth and had a profuse uh, backdrop of uh, bleed. Uh, so referred to us for uh, management. So as emphasized, um, uh, we did some uh, extensive history and uh, we did uh, the surgical uh, planning as uh, we will show in the next case. Uh, Sanjeev or Yatu or uh, Dr. Ayer, anybody would like to chip in to say what would be the extensive maxillary uh, history which you would be worried about in this patient? You're going to show the image? Uh, no. Ah, that's great. the image. Okay. Sanjeev has the control. Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, Subhu, you, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I see some, uh, you know, from this image, I see erosion of the bone and involvement of the maxilla, maxilla as well as it is extending into the nasal cavity. So, uh, my, you know, I'm just talking about the primary surgical treatment. If, if when, when we do it, you need to resect it. So, it will be basically an infrastructure maxillectomy type of defect. Uh, and I would uh, think in terms of reconstruction versus obturator versus followed by reconstruction, whatever is that. So that will be the way I would look at it, uh, depending upon the scenario which we see after the section. Reconstruction, I can come to once you show me the defect, I can tell you what I would think. 
Yeah, I think we uh, do not have any images on that, but uh, I think the take home point in this is obviously uh, uh, the uh, necessity to uh, resect that portion of the maxilla because yeah. of the functional problem of continuous yeah. hemorrhage. Uh, isn't it free? Yeah. Uh, the extension in this case, I mean, what I wanted to emphasize to the audience is it's common to see a juvenile angiofibroma or a patient ah. walk in with an inverted papilloma, similar uh, situation. And uh, on extensive uh, uh, talking to the patient, you would say that you would have intractable epistaxis, which uh, was uh, initially missed on the history taking, I guess, in the uh, initial referral. And... Uh, intractable uh, epistaxis would certainly give you a chance that this is a nasopharyngeal pathology which could be going on. And uh, that was my fear initially when uh, I saw this patient. Uh, Sanjay, so what, what was can, your... Can I, yeah. can I just uh, intervene here? Sure, why, sure. why uh, My greatest problem here would be what uh, Srini said, the diagnosis, right? This is something which is uh, not typical of a vascular malformation. It can be vascular tumor. It can be uh, whatever what Sini was telling, you know, anything. So the question is, will I do a biopsy or not before I go ahead? Because vascular tumors, I would like to do a biopsy because I would like to know whether it's malignant or not and then get uh, around that. And uh, if it is an inverter papilloma, definitely the site of this one, doesn't uh, doesn't relate to an inverter papilloma, so I'm not too much. And nasopharyngeal angiofibroma also I would discount. My DD would be between a vascular malformation versus a vascular tumor, which I would get uh, more inputs from uh, Srikanth before I uh, proceed with that. You know, even MR and uh, soft tissue, all those things before I do. That is my worry. You know, in this particular case. So how do you actually uh, control the vas? You obviously did not do a biopsy. Did you do a biopsy? I did a biopsy just to make. Ah, right. I, so you I, did I a biopsy. It was and not a JNA. Right. What did you get? Is the board? Yeah, uh, it was an it was a negative rule out of all the things which I wanted to make sure. Okay. Okay. And uh, so how? Yeah, the the question I wanted was, did it actually? Uh, how did you stop the uh, the uh, vascularity? I mean, how did you control the vascularity? We, uh, we did try to get an embolization, but we could not cannulate uh, the internal maxillary. So we packed it with all, uh, 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 there is a picture, I guess, uh, with the vasoconstrictive uh, uh, material. We had uh, uh, neck control and a endoscopic assisted resection. So do you want to highlight on why you used the endoscopic controlled uh, resection? Uh, I mean, endoscopic assisted in this case. Uh, so I, I could have a posterior and additional set of view from the back. So there is a completion of resection. As we had said about treatment of vascular tumors, even though it's not cancer, even though we are not doing a margin resection, uh, a complete vascular envelope resection in this case uh, would be the most ideal uh, way to prevent it from you know, leaving something behind or uh, leaving a uh, perfuser behind. Yeah. So like Dr. C.D. said, the complete resection is important. One is to, uh, to not to leave behind residual tumor, which even if you leave, it's a hematomatous lesion. So even if you leave behind, yeah, it may not be all that much of a problem, but the biggest problem would be uh, uh, uncontrolled bleeding if you actually cut into the lesion. So to be able to get around the lesion while excising it is uh, a key uh, factor in uh, the surgical excision of such um, encompassed it or uh, pseudo encapsulated tumors like this. Neto, do you have any uh, inputs on? Uh, uh, no, I would agree with what Subhu and Srini were saying, initially establishing the diagnosis. Uh, but the features that perhaps will be more in keeping with the benign type diagnosis is principally little ulceration in the oral mucosa. And he didn't particularly say a lot of the teeth were loose. Uh, but when you can see the CT as such, it's a mass lesion that is part with the increased enhancement. 
so and with some bone destruction so that will be the principal concern initially would it be a, a hyperemic malignant lesion a hyperemic tumor no. Uh, and vascular malformation will be the second. Uh, any questions from the uh, viewers? Yeah, so, Sanjeev, been the. Exactly. Yeah, sorry. One minute, one minute, Rina. Yes. yes. Uh, like the previous case, what I was trying to highlight was occasionally you can leave the bone and curate it out, but in a vascular tumor, as Dr. Axtella. Ayer was saying. Curating a maxilla sometimes is a futile case. So it would be easier for a resection, complete resection and reconstruction. So uh, it's a contrast to the previous one where the, the concern is a little different than here. Yeah, totally agree because uh, one is a malformation and one is a tumor. tumor. And second is uh, in, a, in a maxilla, it is not very easy to actually curate it out and leave the and uh, do an extracorporeal reimplantation of the maxilla as it is in the case of a stock bone like the mandible. I totally agree with you on that aspect. And um, I think uh, uh, Dr. Rina had a question. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev, there was a question. Uh, what is the histological diagnosis of this uh, patient? And uh, yeah, that's the question that has been asked. And how did you uh, control the bleeding since you've done an endoscopic uh, resection? Yeah, so I think Dr. Srini has mentioned that how we control the bleeding in the second uh, in his uh, the second question in his uh, explanation of the surgical procedure they attempted embolization but it wasn't very successful so they went ahead and uh, did it under vascular control which is eca control basically and uh, regarding uh, what was the other question uh, the first it's question histological diagnosis histological yeah srini what was the uh, final histological uh, diagnosis uh, as uh, Dr. Ayo was saying, it was a non-specific uh, vascular, uh, multiple, uh, what do you call, uh, blood-filled uh, uh, spaces with fibroblastic uh, endothelial lining. The dilated vascular spaces, that's all yeah. what you see under, yeah, without, and they do not take up blood staining uh, because of the fact that it's not a, uh, uh, was it a hema hemangioma or? Tensile tumor perhaps? Hello? Say that again. Was it a giant cell tumor? I mean, was there any No, suspicion? it wasn't. It was. So it was by a system of exclusion that they came to the diagnosis rather than, uh, you know, it wasn't uh, the angiofibroma, nor was it uh, uh, inverted papilloma. So the conclusion was it was a vascular malformation. So we move on to the uh, Next just case. a question. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, does uh, does taking intraoperative frozen sections uh, work in this case to confirm that we have got the entire lesion out, or don't you don't do it for benign lesion? That's uh, the Pini, if you do you want if you have confirmed preoperatively that it's a malignancy or an oncological resection, so intraoperative, if you have doubts, you can certainly look at it, but you will not have a specific answer with frozen section intraoperatively. So at this moment, I wanted to ask meaning uh, for reconstruction opinions on this patient. Yeah. So reconstruction, uh, Subhu, uh, like you rightly mentioned, you would not go ahead with uh, immediate reconstruction, but you would think uh, of uh, re replacing it with an obturator. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't. I was giving it as a choice. Right. right. Uh, it all depends upon how does the uh, defect look like at the end of, and what is the bleeding type. I mean, I would uh, not mind doing a delayed reconstruction after four days. You pack it, come back, and then do the reconstruction. So that is not a problem. I was just, uh, you know, th these are the options. You know, you can put an operator and then do it uh, leisurely after six months. Or uh, you have a choice of immediate reconstruction, which can be uh, which can be of different uh, different things, uh, starting from uh, pedicle flaps like a temporalis uh, myofascial flap versus uh, free soft tissue flap like um, obvious choice, easy choice would have been radial forearm flap and then provide with a denture or a fibula with a skin or DCA, whatever, whatever bone flap. So being a young fellow, um, a benign lesion, I would 
choose a maybe a bone flap because that would be giving a better sulcus better uh, provision for dental rehabilitation than the all the others and that choice can be depending upon the defect yeah, i can do it on after 3 4 days or i might uh, delay it for 6 months so you you have you have been mentioning it uh, time and again about uh, the need for a slightly delayed do you want to tell the viewers why why you actually yeah. do not you know you prefer they, not they, to do it immediately the reason is two twofold one is that it is extremely difficult to control the bleeding in these cases maxilla and huge neck masses you know where you need a reconstruction you know, a huge neck vascular malformation or involved in mandible and all those things even though whatever you do there will be hemodynamically the patient might have gone into a bit of hypotension uh, then uh, coming back it might ooze so the best possible way of control of the bleeding is packing this we have to understand that most of these bleedings will stop with packing and then 48 hours of packing will control most of the bleedings so i would resort to that in case there is a problem secondly i have a, I'll see all these vessels which are supplying the lesion there are huge don't look at the arteries alone you have a lot of veins dilated veins and they are all in a state of flux at the time of you know that uh, resection let them calm down for a few days to make it do a bit more hemodynamically hyper less hyperdynamic before i choose my reconstruction because the chances of vessel getting into a problem in this uh, thickened arteries and thickened veins if it is a high flow lesion is quite high so that is another reason why i would wait for few days so on that note uh, i think uh... Uh, in a time constraint, we shall move on to the uh, next case, which is uh, Dr. Ayers, and uh, I would request him to uh, tell us more about it. Uh, this is a this case was presented to uh, mainly emphasize on uh, the you you know how do you manage tackle with a huge lesion, huge lesion. This was a lady, young lady, uh, who had a massive lesion involving the shoulder. You can see that. And it was extending from the angle of mandible to a deltoid, and it was going inferior to clavicle in the thorax. Can I have that uh, MR? And why uh, she came to us was uh, she had uh, you could see that uh, blisters, which uh, started bleeding profusely, and she had been admitted three, four times, and a couple of times it was a life-threatening bleed. So, and people were a bit worried to get and do something for her because of. Simple sheer uh, largeness of the lesion and difficulty to control. So you can see the imaging. Next, go ahead. Uh, you can see the this uh, Srikanth. You must be remembering this case. We had done this. Uh, you know, we looked at the uh, the, the the vascular uh, supply was common carotid and subclavian. Now the question was again. This uh, Srikanth will answer uh, that. I know we were looking at uh, how do we block these vessels to go into that. Challenges were to one is to get uh, bloodless field. You know it has to be uh, the surgery should not be life threatening too much. Uh, secondly, uh, how do you? This was going. If you look at the lesion, uh, taking it out of the brachial plexus and all would have been very difficult, and taking it out without damaging the thoracic structures would have been difficult. So. A preoperative embolization or any of those measures was out of question, uh, and so we thought, how do we do it? This was our first case when we thought, uh, can we think of? Can you go ahead next? Next one. Um, see, this was the lesion which was going. You know, I yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. And this was the time when we thought, uh, you know, can we? We had uh, seen one report of. Uh, uh, it was uh, reported by Ian uh, Jackson where about one case where they had uh, used the cardiopulmonary bypass to get a bloodless field to do this. And then we discussed with the family. We had a good cardiothoracic team. We had uh, discussed with the radiology team also about uh, all the uh, you know extent and all those things. So we thought we will offer that because this was a life-threatening situation anyway, and they they were ready to. Uh, go ahead with that. So we planned about this uh, cardiac 
pulmonary bypass. And then a lot of, this was the first case. And then we had a lot of planning to be made. We didn't know how to proceed, in fact. And then we had a team meetings and we thought uh, that we will go ahead. And there are two, if you look at it, there are two varieties of, uh, you know, uh, hypothermia. What you achieve by cardiac by, bypass is that cardiac bypass is very simple thing for a cardiac thoracic surgeon because they do it day in and out. We think too much about it. But for them, it is simple. Connect it to a lung, heart lung machine, divert all the blood. So you have a bloodless field, cool down the blood. And then the time of ischemia for the critical structures is the most important thing. And we decided that we will go into a control hypothermia, which will give us about 90 minutes of bloodless field. And then the other one was that they have a tendency, they have, a, uh, they use the sucker, which you see in that uh, cannula. It is taken and filtered and given back. So the amount of blood needed is uh, less. So again, here, but they do it from the cardiac, you know, in the mediastinum, which is a sterile area. When you look at the neck, it was a bit difficult. So we created a, a sort of dam for sucking and that type of thing. And finally, uh, you cannot, again, you have to think that the time duration you get is also limited. So you had to resect most of it. But when it comes to a crux matter where it's extremely difficult, put the patient on bypass and do it. Next one. Yeah, next one. I'm, I'm finishing here. Next. So uh, it could be removed very comfortably that, like that. And then again, the same principle. Uh, we didn't, uh, we just packed it. Because again, here's a problem. You are uh, heparinized the patient. You are uh, taking them out of the, uh, you know, uh, machine. Then they will have the uh, ooze. So the only thing you could do is to pack the cavity, come out. And then we wanted to do it in three, four days. It was not good. So we waited for three months, three weeks to, for this to fill up and then covered with the ALT flap. So all the principles which I mentioned uh, have been, uh, you know, illustrated in this case. That's it. We have done uh, five, so six the, cases, I'll... six cases out of which uh, one was dangerous because there's a profuse bleed. See the uh, reason why that patient had a problem was that we didn't realize the internal carotid connection there and which couldn't be, which couldn't be this thing and he bled to death. So we had one mortality out of the six cases. All other five were uh, doing that. So the uh, highlights of this case is basically one, obtaining a totally avascular field and the window of opportunity, the window of surgical opportunity is limited to about uh, 90 minutes. So at, in 90 minutes, you are able to actually dissect uh, through all the important structures in this area. Like the, uh, I think the brachial plexus, you would encounter the phrenic, the brachial plexus, etc., which would have to be uh, you know, uh, preserved uh, judiciously. And then second thing is the fact that uh, you delay the ultimate uh, reconstruction. And I think, uh, Subhu, you used an ALT in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a sculptured ALT to shoot the contours and all those things, yeah. So uh, do the other panelists have any, uh, uh, any suggestions or any... Uh, only thing is, uh, I have no personal experience. The only experience that I have is one case that I was involved with in Amrita with Subhu. Um, and what we will normally say is if anything like this comes, then perhaps send it to a center where they have more experience <laughs> send it to than actually <laughs> trying to do it uh, on a local basis or at least speak to people who have had experiences because they are extremely high risk patients. And also people who require some sort of management because these are not lesions where you can decide to treat them conservatively because that is going to lead to significant risks of death. And Dr. Dr. Murthy, uh, you you are you are probably you are involved with uh, Dr. Subhu at this uh, for this particular case. So you would uh, like to tell us why uh, this patient was uh, not a fit candidate for actually embolite embolic uh, vascular control. See, uh, can we go back to the MR angio in this? Can we go back to the slides? Yes. See, uh, one thing that will strike you here is that there are no major large veins draining out. So you can see the entire venous system. The jugular vein you see is just the normal sized jugular vein coming from the brain. 
and yeah. if you look at the carotids and the subclavian which are right close to such a large vascular malformation they are not hypertrophic mm -hmm. so one thing that strikes me here is from a uh, diagnostic point of view this isn't a shunting lesion this is not an avm this is not a high flow lesion but right. it is filling through small branches from subclavian and even internal carotid you can see the the, the circle at the top there on the right hand side so um, when you do an angio in these patients um, it's a completely different picture what you would see is you would not see so much of enhancing tumor because this is gadolinium getting into that and it's very sensitive you can pick it up like a nice white cauliflower like thing but on a dsa you will just see a puff into it and you will see normal vessels and a lot of tiny branches that's it so if you there is a difficulty in first of all selecting them and uh, even if you select them chances of safely embolizing is very uh, i mean the chance or risk of non target embolization is very high and i wouldn't want to get into a branch of the common carotid which is just uh, two or three centimeters long and into a vessel into a thing which is not flowing very fast i'm sure to uh, you know get a reflex so this is actually i would say this is like a real this is an imangioma in my opinion like a cavernous geoma large sacs maybe it just started out as a lymphatic lymphatic venous but more of a venous or a cavernous imangioma kind of uh, thing where there is filling by small arterial branches without shunt those things are difficult to embolize and highly risky oh. i think the key is that low flow uh, cavernous hemangioma without any obvious feeders are not uh, candidates for uh, you know use for embol endovascular embolization so embolization is out of question and i think dr subramanian may have done an excellent job with this so any questions from the uh, the uh, viewers can I, dr sandeep can i ask some questions yeah sure So the first question is uh, how do you uh, how did dr ayer uh, select the uh, recipient vessel uh, to do the uh, uh, to the uh, to do the uh, reconstruction the microvascular reconstruction oh i, I think uh, the neck vessels were quite okay if you look at it it is lateral and the neck vessels we didn't do uh ligate any of the major things you can see the neck vessels so they were quite okay and then we had no i don't think we i don't remember that we had any problem in getting a good vessel in the neck i think it was a routine thing at that time okay. and uh, one more question sir how do you discuss yeah. the possibility of intraoperative death with the family so yes it's a it's a problem it's a problem see cardiac part uh, as i told you for cardiac surgeons uh, open heart surgery bypass is a routine thing so but uh, that part is explained to them they always have a risk uh, sort of uh, assessment and they inform the patient about the risk involved which we leave it to them the vascular part uh, is more dangerous because you we, we can cause the death rather than the cardiac surgery so there we have to be see these are not cases which uh, which can be treated otherwise which can be left otherwise it's like a extensive cancer which is going to kill you so there you are giving an option of this with the, all the attendant risks of this one including you know your surgical morbidity because of your vascular intervention so you have to be very very frank to the family and then they have to agree for it. all the cases it, which we did uh, nothing else could be done see you don't go into these cases with uh, if there is any other option available i don't think you should jump into it i think it is weighing risk uh, against benefit and explaining it not a easy thing but uh, i guess you know they will take it uh, if it is explained to them in the proper way uh again uh, dr ayer's case please uh. yeah i you i see this is a uh, this case is shown mainly to highlight a couple of things in uh, management of this vascular lesion first of all this is a mixed lesion where there was you can see some 
uh, you know, the skin becoming, uh, showing changes of involution. So some amount of mixed element of hemangioma uh, element would have been there, which has involuted, whereas the big baggy lesions have uh, persisted with age. And so uh, when you look at it, surgical treatment is the only thing to be done now because sclerosants will do hardly anything at present in this. Uh, the patient has come for aesthetic reasons also. So when you look at it, you have to look at the areas which have been affected, the nose, upper lip, and then uh, the whole area. So you have to look at uh, that way when you are going to resect. And uh, I would look at the plastic surgery uh, viewpoint in this particular case, because otherwise uh, there's nothing in this. You have to reconstruct those uh, areas which are going to be excised. To me, the upper lip and the columella and the nose would have been the most important, obvious uh, aesthetic uh, units which have to be addressed. Shall I stop or go ahead, uh, Sanjeev? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Subhu was trying to tell us about uh, you know how oh, we come to a surgical uh, decision making, dividing the face into different subunits and deciding the. Uh, uh, pathologic part and from the normal part and trying to preserve as much of the normal part as possible. So, uh, uh, does Ethulandan or uh, Srini have any uh, 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 I think Subhu was saying, I think principally the decision is going to be cosmesis uh, uh, and uh, subunit, uh, facial unit uh, based reconstruction is important and the importance of trying to minimize your yeah, scars going across units. So most of the lip units try and keep them separate to your nasal units. So uh, uh, attempt uh, to reconstruct each specific uh, unit and such on its own, uh, rather than trying to combine all and keep them distinct. I think it's going to be the importance. And also do it as potentially a staged procedure if it is required, rather than trying to do everything together. Uh, so you have some time as such to establish a firm basis and decide on how things are going to settle down before you go on to do additional procedures. So uh, Subhu, will you uh, explain about yeah, how uh, you actually... Yeah, I thought, uh, the, see, first of all, we looked at this as subunits. Uh, to look at the lip first. And then if you look at it, there are a lot of good lip tissue available. So you excise it preserving the lip tissue, whatever is possible, and get it right with the muscle and uh, all those things, which you, have, you can see, obviously, in the picture. And then the nose, again, you could uh, create some amount of columella and ela, all those things out of that. So this is a first stage. Then go ahead. Next one, can, I, can, I go, can you click on the next? See, next step was the nasal part. Then here you have, if you if you ask any man, it might say that you could tackle it in different ways. You can excise, you can put a graft, you can you know you can take nasal labial flap or whatever is that. But forehead is the best for a nose. And again, nasal reconstruction. If you look at it, um, you can you have to use either total reconstruction. There are people who will say that you reconstruct the entire nose with the forehead flap, that is better. For us, for me at that time, I thought that we will uh, take away the tip lobule and the LR complex as a single unit and cover it with the uh, forehead flap. Again, uh, expansion versus non no expansion is your choice. But here, because of the lack of tissue in the forehead, you could see her hairline. We put an expander and then did it in stages. Next one. Next slide. So, so as I told you, you could uh, you could take that nasal uh, tip subunit with the ala as a single unit to get it right. So, um, uh, why this case is presented? Uh, why I gave this case for presentation was to look at. Uh, basic plastic surgery techniques in uh, involuted uh, type of hemangioma where your idea is only aesthetic sort of restoration. Yeah, so this is an excellent example of how you can stage your reconstruction. Now, as you know, even though it's a vascular tumor, 
a vascular tumor which can be uh, you know the treatment can be delayed so you have to use the benefits of things like uh, staging the procedure the surgical procedure as well as use of uh, expansile tissue so expanding the tissue to obtain uh, and obtaining the excess excess tissue that you get with the expansion for the reconstruction these are ideal cases for that uh, which cannot be regularly used for uh, situations where there are malignancies or even benign pathology sometimes where you cannot partially excise anything sweeney uh, caution of uh, care again just a fundamental for juniors make sure that it's not a syndromic neurofibromatosis ah. case or something before you attempt any uh, resection yeah so uh, do the viewers have any questions in this there are no questions sir okay so we move on to the uh, next one uh, 52 year old healthy male uh, he actually walked into the office and uh, when he opened his mouth uh, his tongue just rolled out so that is how he presents to you a large tongue uh, bluish reducible uh the posterior extent of the uh, enlargement is not uh, visualized but this is the clinical appearance and i think uh, one of the good things about uh, vascular anomalies is clinically they are so obvious that you really do not need to go ahead and do a biopsy uh subo you would agree with me that yeah that you don't really need to because most of them are clinically very obvious yeah. all you need is to do a good image to actually identify the lesion so uh can um, uh to tell me i mean what, what uh, do you have anything in mind when you see a lesion like this on how you would uh treat it okay uh, so given the uh, given as you said he is quite an elderly a 52 year old gentleman has had it for a long period of time and looking at the clinical features of it being bluish and reducible you are thinking in terms of low flow venous malformation or is there a lymphovenous element to that and as far as diagnosis is concerned as such uh, i would uh, want to do an mri to not necessarily look at this particular part of the element uh, but uh, any significant uh, extension of this lesion elsewhere uh, and clinical examination often will give me information about vascularity but perhaps an mri will give me some additional confirmation that it continues to be a low flow lesion uh, dr srikant any uh, suggestions on uh... image or you think mri would be the most appropriate i think uh, in this case i mean your fingers would tell you that whether this is high flow or low flow yeah and uh, i think uh, probably doing you know, we can always do an ultrasound i guess to you know confirm the what it most likely going to be a lot of vascular space is there or cystic spaces without any uh, doppler pick up and uh, yes i think the only purpose of an mri would to uh, would be to know how far down the tongue it's going you know exactly yes, yes exactly so whether there is um, the deeper muscles of the tongue or the the nasal the nasal pharynx posterior extent exactly yeah. posterior extent. that is what sridi uh, any idea about uh, how you would uh, if this patient was yours so as a surgeon I mean i would like to take care of it but my treatment should not be more debilitating for him as dr shrikant was saying that his swallow has been preserved um, and he's been speaking fine but just to complete the picture of treatment with an ultrasound i would see with the microcystic spaces or microcystic spaces which i can make them smaller by even scarring them either with a sclerosent or a bleomycin or something like that and then uh, surgically stage him so in this situation we actually uh, did a, a functional excision uh, i think subu also would agree with yeah. that a functional yeah. excision yeah. is what i mean there is no point in achieving a total excision because it would right. be a total lossectomy uh, functional excision is uh, uh, removing uh, that part of the uh, tongue which is excess uh, and the ideal way of doing it is uh, as you can see in this picture satinsky clamps to the uh, excess part portion of the tongue so that you reduce the vascular outflow into the terminal portion of the tongue and uh, the uh, raw surfaces are sutured the muscular layers are sutured to control the vascularity so it is excised in the form of a v and uh, a vy closure is done and uh, the patient usually 
ends up with a reasonably good functional tongue. So uh, this is uh, possibly the ideal way of treating such a macroglossic tongue, which is a low flow venous malformation. Now the question here always is, uh, uh, Srini was suggesting about uh, intralesional emboli, uh, sorry, uh, steroids to be injected to uh, fibrosal lesion. Uh, one of the, um, uh, I do not I'll share it with you, but one of the problems I find in terminal structures such as the tongue or the pinna of the uh, lip, etc., is uh, the unpredictability of how, uh, what would happen after you have injected the steroid. Sometimes it can just ulcerate, part of it can fall off. Do you share that uh, concern, uh, Subhu? Yeah, see, the, I, I would like to mention a couple of points regarding this. First of all, the sclerosin injection, small lesions are good. They, they do behave very well. You know, if you have a small tongue lesion with the vascular, the first obvious choice is a sclerosin because it uh, makes it shrink. But huge lesions, it is, you know, it is, uh, I don't think it will work fully uh, at, at all. And then you are, you are trying to get a functional tongue. A yeah, fibrous tongue is not a fi functional tongue. So for me, what you did would be the way you would. The first thing I would, uh, principalizing this one, you, res you keep what you want and resect the remain. Like what you did is right. You put the Sadinsky clamp in the area beyond which you wanted to resect. So the remaining tongue, what was there, was needed for that patient. And imagine that after that, it will all, you know, you can, you can work with the sclerosin later on with some amount of excess tissue there. So that is the way I would also treat it. And then the tongue big lesions, don't be worried. They behave much better than many of the other things. You know, you get a very satisfactory result of a functional tongue if you treat it like uh, the way Sanjeev did. So do we have any questions from the viewers, uh, Reena or uh, Pushkar? Yes, yes, Dr. Sanjeev. Yeah, Reena. Uh, see, uh, there's a question asking, if the lesion had involved the floor of the mouth, how different would the management be? And what uh, was the recurrence or what are the chances of recurrence in this case? Two questions. Yeah, so the, for the first question, um, this lesion, definitely the, there was uh, involvement of the floor of the mouth. Although the uh, venous component had not caused any swelling of the floor of the mouth, there was definitely bluish discoloration of the floor of the mouth. And the MR uh, scan actually showed the extension of the lesion into the floor of the mouth, which was left alone because it wasn't of much uh, uh, significant functional uh, outcome to the patient. So uh, we did not uh, do much about that. The second question was, uh, can we repeat that again? The second question, Rina. Rina, second question. Sorry, sorry. Uh, so the second question is, what, uh, what is the recurrence with this case? Over yeah, so this patient was uh, followed up for about... Uh, five years after this procedure. There was about a one third uh, enlargement of the tongue over that, but then after that five years, he's uh, stopped coming back. I do not know, I have not uh, seen him after that, but there is a possibility that uh, the tongue can grow back a little bit more and would require a close follow-up. If it grows back again, uh, the procedure would be the same. This procedure is not a very tough procedure, so you would actually use a similar procedure for uh, dealing in such a dealing with such a situation. Thank so uh, moving on yeah, to Sanjeev, the uh, Sanjeev, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, the first question is that uh, if there is no setting ski clamp available, what instrument would you suggest? Uh, see, the uh, the uh, advantage of using setting ski clamp is. Uh, it is like a vascular clamp. So it can compress the vascular component without actually causing tissue necrosis. That is the advantage that of using. Yeah, so please. Uh, so, oh, sorry. Uh, um, so if you don't have a certain skis clamp, yes, I mean, uh, you can take just silk sutures, a zero silk suture. And once you mark that area out, I mean, you can put any Kelly's clamp or uh, any of this, uh, do a locking suture around the V, whatever you're doing, and then uh, close it back again. 
Right. And the second question is regarding airway. Uh, do you keep these patients uh, intubated overnight or are they on a T-piece? Are they on a ventilator? What is your protocol? Yeah. The, uh, many of these patients would require a pre-surgical elective tracheostomy if you are really worried about uh, a large uh, engorged tongue postoperatively, which would compromise the airway. Alternately, you can have uh, just a nasopharyngeal airway or uh, intubated patient overnight. So there's no specific guideline which you follow? There is no specific guideline. I mean, whatever you're worried about, but definitely airway is a worry and you should be uh, in a position to have either of these uh, uh, facilities available to you so that uh, the patient does not, you know, you're not called back in with that distressed airway at a large time where you'll have to do an emergency tracheostomy or a tracheotomy. As Dr. Etu said, there's always a possibility there are multiple smaller lesions going into the airway, which sometimes even MR cannot pick up. So you would have done all your preoperative workup, either with a flexible endoscopy or whatever. So uh, moving on to the last two cases. Uh, this is one of uh, Dr. Etinandans, and I would request him to uh, highlight the case. Okay. So she's a 43-year-old lady who presented with a bony heart swelling in her right front orbital area. So she'd been on a holiday and noticed this lump. Uh, and it had gradually increased in size and was having some increasing discomfort to that area. So when she came to us, she had an asymptomatic swelling in that area. Uh, if you can just go on to the next slide, uh, Sanjeev. Uh, the next one. Uh, and she had a CT scan, which demonstrated uh, the, those findings. Uh, and Srikanth, is there anything that you can say based on the clinical or the radiographic findings as to what this lesion could possibly be? Since my position here is supposed to be as an interventional radiologist, you're putting me in a very difficult Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, but this basically shows an expansive lesion of the frontal bone, which what uh, we, you know, we used to call or we call a ground glass appearance there. It, it is like a focal fibrous dysplasia. I mean, uh, that would be my guess. Because it looks benign. It's got a very sharp borders. I'm not worried about malignant nature. But if you want me to give one diagnosis, I would say it's a fibrous dysplasia. Okay. Uh, and those will be the things that one will have to think about uh, such, uh, when you, uh, we're talking about vascular malformations and uh, CT findings uh, such would be something similar to a sunburst type appearance per se. And there are lots of fibrosis lesions which look fairly similar and the mm -hmm. diagnosis often is not very apparent. But one of the things that you will have to take into account is that it is a well-localized lesion rather than diffuse borders. And as far as she was concerned, she initially elected that she did not want anything being done. Uh, and so we just uh, had a, a CT surveillance and another scan done a year down the line when the lesion had increased in size and was becoming more symptomatic. And she elected to have the lesion exhausted. But the age group is not like typically like an event this place. I think. Right. Yeah. And there was no preceding history of trauma exactly. for her. So, uh, the... so I think uh, Etu will highlight on uh, the uh, steps on how the uh, reconstruction was planned and executed. Okay. So as far as she was concerned, as such, uh, she had a, a patient-specific implant made. So she had some CT with a simple stereolithographic model. Uh, you can go back to the previous one, uh, Sanji. Uh, so I had a simple CT and a stereolithographic made where we had planned the excision and the, the opposite side was just mirrored for us to get the stereolithographic model. And we just bent the mesh as such preoperatively in, in the department. You can go on to the next one. Uh, and she had a hemicoronal flap and the lesion was excised and removed with image guidance. Uh, 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 and our preoperative diagnosis was that it was an intravascular venous malformation. So we were expecting some oozing from that area and she did ooze a little, which was fairly easily controlled with just bone wax. 
In her case, she had a small craniotomy around that lesion and with image guidance as such had the lesion excised and reconstructed. Go on to the next one. And if we were to do it now, then we would tend to do it with a cutting guide and a peak. And so she had a, this patient had a cutting guide. So it makes the craniotomy or includes the craniotomy into the excision. Uh, and we, it's just about cutting around the lines. And here you can see on the medial aspect, we seem to be cutting through the lesion. And that was because the lesion was extending up to the frontal sinus and we did not want to enter the frontal sinus. So we elected as such that we will cut through the lesion and then get gently burr down that lesion, move the frontal sinus lining out of the way. And she just had the pericranial mm -hmm. flap placed beneath it uh, and then subsequently reconstructed with the peak implant. You can go on to the next one. Uh, and that is a relatively acceptable postoperative result. Yeah, I think uh, uh, most of us would uh, surgically treat the patient uh, similarly. Uh, the only difference uh, I would think is uh, about uh, whether this could be, uh, you know, contoured and re-implant the same bone is one option, whether it is available. And uh, what are the other materials that could be used for uh, the uh, reconstruction? You said uh, peak is one. Uh, the other is uh, just use a titanium uh, foil or titanium mesh. And uh, what, what, what is your opinion about using the bone itself? Meaning, as far as you're concerned, so, uh, uh, it is a complex three-dimensional structure. Uh, and if you are going to attempt a curatage and putting it back, there's likely to be some resorption in that area, which is going to be quite prominent as such and quite significant if it does happen. So it's the unpredictability of that in such an area that it's not something that we would normally tend to contemplate. So uh, I think time is running fast. So uh, do we have any inputs from the panelists or shall we move on to the next there case? Is a question, Dr. Sanjeev, if that is yeah, Rina. Uh, yeah. Was this, was this lesion diagnosed based on clinical and radiological findings? If there, was there any uh, tissue biopsy preoperatively done? That's a yeah, that's been asked. So the patient didn't have any tissue biopsy preoperatively, but postoperatively, as I said, normally we would tend to submit that to post histological examination, and it was reported as a, uh, intraosseous venous malformation. So they would not routinely have glut staining, and this was glut negative. There was no other features apart from uh, uh, a venous malformation. So we go on to the. Uh... The last case of the evening, again, one of uh, Dr. Etunandan's uh, patient. Okay. And this is quite an interesting patient, as such, which will have quite a lot of relevance and concerns for a lot of us. It's a three-year-old girl who presented with a bony heart swelling in a left mandible, uh, which, they, which the parents claimed had been present for a period of time. She had had occasional bleeding while brushing. And on clinical examination, the gingiva overlying that area was not inflamed. None of the teeth were particularly mobile. She had bony heart lesions or a bony heart swelling. And the OPG as such demonstrates this multifocal radiolucent lesion in the left mandible with some teeth erupted and erupting through that. Uh, uh, and this was done in another hospital. So they had attempted a biopsy of that lesion and the patient had torrential bleeding. So uh, Etu, can I just uh, interrupt you here? So uh, yep. uh, can the, I mean, panelists, uh, the other panelists tell me, why would you uh, think of a biopsy in this situation? Is there any reason why you would think of a biopsy in this situation? What are the other the lesion being other possibilities. I mean, what are the other possibilities? What are the differential diagnoses? Oh, I would uh, do a bit more imaging and look at it critically again before uh, I do a biopsy because vascular lesions, it could be a vascular lesion. So I would do a CT, CT angio, or even MR uh, to look at uh, the critically the lesion before I do a biopsy. 
it's also an age group where you get fibrosis lesion then it's coming yeah. back to the same thing so i think uh, it, it, there are a lot of other dds for it surely so one of the other things i think we are worried about is giant cell tumors i mean yes uh, yeah giant cell lesions yeah. typically the age is uh, in favor of that so I have to exclude giant cell lesions which can be treated more conservatively but i think the uh, the intervention was more uh, eto because of the brisk bleeding yeah. during yeah. the so, so, so i think the uh, in, interesting bits with this is anchi is whether the first investigation would be a biopsy or would you consider any other investigations at that stage and if you were to consider a pre operative investigation what would that be and i guess a lot of people will possibly say a ct and i think it's going to be quite important as such if you're considering a ct as to whether you're going to request a, a ct with contrast because i think it's un, unless you have a clinic high his high incidence of clinical suspicion as such you perhaps might not request a ct angio per se but as to whether a ct contrast will be something that most people will request for what you think will be a purely intra bony lesion for somebody who is young okay so dr murthy uh, in terms of uh, controlling the vas bleeding because of the uh, brisk vascularity at the time of biopsy uh, do you have any suggestions that uh, would help see i think i think in this particular case i think the initial uh, you know the emergent period is over you know and you know you are looking at imaging and uh, i think in any case uh, with the uh, you know with the dental radiograph like that i would uh, recommend imaging no doubt uh, the thing is that in a child who is just 3 years old again i would not jump to doing a ct scan i think an mr though it's a little more complicated requiring anesthesia and all that an mr with contrast would be probably the most uh, safe thing to do for this child so the patient didn't have any additional imaging the clinical diagnosis was that of a giant cell lesion so which is why they went to okay and, and did the biopsy and the patient had torrential bleeding so on the th in theater uh, what if anything can be done to control the bleeding packing Uh, so you, yeah, you will. Uh, that tooth is out, and then you would pack it. Uh, it it was just a biopsy, Subu. Uh, so they didn't take a tooth out. It's just a biopsy in the vestibule. Yeah, uh, you mean to say this was? Uh, I mean, after the, I mean, after attempting the biopsy, they shifted the patient directly to emergency. Is it like that? No, no, no. So this was done in another hospital, and then it was transferred across to our hospital. for the bleed right for the bleed, for the bleed. Uh, oh, but i'm way. i'm asking in theater what if anything could be done in theater if somebody was to encounter a situation where they are unexpectedly so i think like subu said if it's a tooth which was pulled out you yep get with the tooth if it was a lateral cortical plate or uh, for the biopsy then you would uh, it's basically trying to plug whatever defect that you have created with yeah. for the biopsy so Uh, if it's a lateral cortical plate you would replace it or you would pack it pack the cavity as much as possible so what are the in this situation what did you actually resort to so what they had done as such is they had packed that area with surgical uh, which they were able to get some control of bleeding called us and we said that the patient can be transferred across to us for further management one of the things that i will ask is because they didn't have access to an interventional radiologist at that stage in their hospital so whereas most surgeons perhaps can have access to the neck in the same setting and what will be the indication or contraindication for trying to get some vascular control in the neck at the yeah, same yeah, setting yeah. should you develop uh, this situation So I, I think it is good that you asked this question, Sanjeev. Can I answer that one? This yeah, question? sure. The the first, uh, I would uh, always advise against uh, external carotid ligation in all these cases, because this is a panic reaction, and that's a very bad thing to do, because it spoils the whole thing later on. You have a external carotid ligation done, you will. Uh, 
you know you, it will develop uh, and you have not removed the lesion whatever type of lesion it is it will attract more blood vessels and then it will be from somewhere else so it uh, takes away your uh, you know it, it makes it difficult for you more than that and later on the surgery also you could use that external carotid for a lot of things so i wouldn't do that first principle is that don't jump into external carotid ligation in these cases i would pack and leave it to see if it is bleeding i would uh, transfer it to a place where there is an interventional radiologist and these are the cases where you might be able to control the bleeding with a good embolization and then plan it accordingly plan it uh, plan your definitive treatment accordingly by resection curettage or whatever you want with the under control that would be the way i would look at it yeah it is interesting subhu actually brought that up because for the viewers uh, 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 external carotid ligation is detrimental in most of these situations uh, what if at all you have to do is external carotid control so you can use yeah. vascular clamps to control the vessel but not completely ligate it because you would need it for future access for interventional radiologists to do their uh, angiograms and their embolization procedures so uh, etho you want to go ahead and tell us what exactly was yeah so we can go on to the next slide so the patient came across to us and uh, and strikant was talking about super selective embolization so so you have a coil which actually or a catheter which comes down the uh, inferior dental artery uh, embolizing only the mandible uh, which is uh, 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 increased blush and the patient had onyx embolization so that controlled the bleeding uh, and and we, she was kept for follow up for a period of time i'll quickly go through the case completely and then we can talk about bits as and as we go along and this was her two years down the line uh, she had some hyperemia in that area and you can't see it very well uh, she has an area of granulation lower down in the vestibule with some black discoloration and this was as a result of onyx being exfoliated and that was just managed conservatively by just picking the onyx off you can go on to the next one and this these were the opgs taken 2 uh, years apart and if you can see at the developing 7 uh, and you can see that the lesion has continued to progress in size So the decision then, as I said, we spoke about it, and I will just tell you what we did, uh, and then we can talk about why that decision was made. So the lesion was con- continuing to progress in size, though she hasn't had any further bleeding episodes nor any discomfort. So it is purely a clinical and a radiological feature of the progression. We can go on to the next one. We can go on to the next one. Ah, oh, yep. Sorry. Uh, and she had a further angiogram which was a, a large residual lesion and this time she had definitive embolization with fill and you can see the cast there and you can go on to the next one sanjeev uh, and that is 5 years down the line now which shows the fill cast in that area uh, and she remains completely asymptomatic and you can see that the teeth have erupted into that area and she has lost a few teeth in and around the vascular malformation with no further bleeding yeah so uh, the the question here would be uh, you have actually staged the entire procedure to uh, symptomatically manage the lesion uh, from the uh, from the when he uh, appeared with the excessive bleeding to when he uh, when the lesion recurred within the mandible uh, however you never took a decision on actually uh a definitive treatment so is there any reason for that etu yeah true so those are the discussions so, so we've had a d- discussion with him and uh, we did discuss as to whether she would have a resection of the lesion or whether we will as far as the clinical features radiological features it is a purely intrabony lesion with very little soft tissue extension as far as she is concerned so we decided as such that if, with the parents uh, that they weren't particularly keen on undergoing a surgical resection at this stage and so she's had that uh, embolized and we know as such uh, 
in a significant proportion of people who have purely intrabony lesions, uh, then it's likely to settle and be sufficient. Uh, but we have the luxury of keeping people under regular follow-ups as such and always reviewing those situations on an ongoing basis. So as far as we are concerned as Anshi, as the surgery was discussed uh, uh, and because it was a purely intrabony lesion uh, and the patients were in particularly keen on a surgical resection, uh, this subsequent embolization was for a curative attempt. So uh, to all the three, uh, uh, I think Dr. Srikanth has... Uh, I you want to ask him a question? No, no, it's okay. If he can, I, I mean, we would need him for a, a case after this. I mean, for a complication. But yeah, uh, interestingly, I would like to ask the panelists. Uh, one of the things that I have found in a couple of cases of mine where we have actually dealt with uh, the lesion in a particular jaw, for example, uh, in the mandible, uh, has uh, gone on to develop a lesion in the maxilla subsequently. So have you all had any experience like that? So this was a, how was the lesion initially treated? So initially it was treated by I mean, embolization, pre-surgical embolization followed by uh, resection of the lesion or excision of the lesion. So the lesion was completely removed. And there was uh, no image. But came down four years down the line with, uh, came back four years down the line with a recurrent lesion in the, not a recurrent, you can call it, but a lesion, a separate lesion in the maxilla. Yeah, true. So uh, I think, so here you're talking about the completeness of resection of the original lesion. And that's always going to be quite difficult to do and what is going to happen in the periphery of any residual lesion which is left behind uh, and increasing neovascularization with recurrence per se. So was there, as far as the pre-op imaging were concerned, was there anything to suggest that the lesion was incompletely excised or was the lesion extending above your excision, around your excision margins? No, this is two totally different uh, uh, because the, the first oh. lesion was in the mandible which was completely excised. And then there was uh, uh, the, nothing in the maxilla and the patient comes back to you after a few years. So uh, the reason I brought this up is uh, Subhush Rini and uh, Etu, it's uh, whether the dynamics of the flow into the lesion has got anything to do with uh, developing a, a collateral lesion in a separate location because the flow is of the same pressure and when you're cutting out that same pressure into one particular lesion and the uh, pressure of flow, it continues in the main vessel like the external carotid and is it likely to then uh, make it more susceptible to develop another lesion? Have you had any experience with that? I would put the other way, like, uh, you know, we had another, we had a similar case where we had resected the maxilla and then, then we had to resect the mandible also. So, this was published uh, as a single fibula going for, you know, we had recurrence of the thing. So, it's a thing. So, but I would uh, think that it is the fault of the bone rather than the vessels. And the nidus, it was bound to have a nidus there. It's bound to have nidus here, which is attracting. And then maybe the maxilla in your, in your case, maxilla was dormant and then it started growing. Probably had a yeah. nidus which was yeah. not... Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If Srikanth was there, I would have asked... To... Srikanth, is he here? No. Srikanth? Because the way... Uh, Yadu, I would have... Uh, in our situation, I would have followed the way which uh, uh, Sanjeev had done in the previous case. Maybe embolized, curated out, packed, and then come back and then rather than, you know, put this way, uh, doing this. I'm not uh, saying that this is not yeah, true. Because, yeah. So maybe that would have been provided the lower cortex seems to be very thick. So I would have, uh, even if I curated, maybe the bone, like Sanjeev's case, if you remember, would have got more thicker and then maybe later on something could have been done for the dentition. Uh, the question I wanted to ask Srikant was, like uh, Oni, she's supposed to be very good for cerebral uh, 
you know all those things because of the small because the large quantity cannot be injected but um, how much is this longevity of this is very doubtful as a permanent sort of uh, you know abolition of the nidus of an avm does it work very well in periphery it might be working well in the you know cns uh, what happens doctor the ir is even yeah. periphery yeah it comes very commonly i have encountered it ulcerating through the scalp or even the lesion black okay. particles keep coming out and you can keep injecting it uh, uh, sanjeev can you just go back to the previous opg uh, and the OPG, sanjeev yeah, the sorry. other case which has been described like that with multiple osseous uh, uh, uh -huh. extensions at least seven bones is uh, gorham stouts again Yeah. um so they do not appear all at the same time and you change the characteristic of one it goes to another one right yeah, yeah so we here, here as well you can see so, so so though it's an opg slightly different you can see the intensity of the onyx that you see is much much okay. less so even in the two year period as such okay. uh, uh, that you can see whereas so fill is what we tend to use now and people find that uh, uh, that's Uh, a lot more suitable as such because they come again in different sizes so they feel that that's going to be much better yeah so the i mean you're right there to when uh, if you onyx another problem we encounter is to get a ct scan afterwards there's a lot of scatter so you cannot see the periphery of the lesion or the characteristics of the lesion sometimes just with onyx now fill is better because it's not doesn't provide a scatter on the ct scan so it is uh, not radio opaque so your ct scans on follow up is fairly good and another thing is spark as well so if you're going to operate uh, on a patient who has had onyx uh, if you use a bipolar or a monopolar yeah. diatomy because you have tantalum particles there uh, you get sparks all over the place and uh, something that you need to be careful about it's like diwali Yeah. So, yeah. so, so I, I think uh, that brings us to the end of the uh, uh, the uh, last case. Are there any questions from the viewers, uh, Doctor Rina or Doctor Pushkar? On this case, there are not no questions. There are two cases. So, yes. So, can I ask you a question? what's your uh, concentration of fill you guys used i mean so they, that would have been a question for shrikant yeah true so uh, anything i don't know about the concentration of fill that they use but they obviously use different particle sizes such uh, uh, and starting off with the larger particles and then smaller particles but I, I i i would not be able to say if there is a concentration that they do i know that they use different particle size but i'm not sure of the concentration have you encountered it coming eroding through the skin or the mucosa uh, no uh, with onyx yes but not with fill fill so can i uh, request uh, i think uh, i we have a couple of cases of complications to be shown we just want to discuss that so uh, can we go back to the uh, slide the uh, desktop that we're sharing you need to share the screen sir yeah no my screen my screen is shared i have not changed no it. no you you off it now please share it again open a presentation share it again please is that so yeah it's fine now you can cut, take it forward sir one more one more yeah yeah, yeah. so Come. yeah so we were uh, i mean we have shown the different scenarios and the different ways of actually uh, controlling ablating uh, reconstructing uh, vascular lesions and uh, i'm really uh, uh, glad to have uh, such uh, good panelists who have uh, contributed very actively in giving me these cases um, this particular case is uh, we, we were describing i mean we all know that vascular lesions have uh, innumerable number of complications anything can go wrong Uh, one from exsanguination to uh, developing cerebrovascular accidents to uh, uh, you know necrosis and ischemia and uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, really you can you this is uh, a slide you sent me can you yeah. uh, 
explain what I, what we are seeing on this slide. This was a slide to emphasize the uh, issues with bleomycin, even though it's fairly commonly available. And uh, bleomycin, even if you give it in the lowest of dose, uh, even the EKG, the ring, the, the annular ring you see on the shoulder, right uh, circle, is the EKG lead. If you rip the EKG lead after giving bleomycin, you can have that uh, pigmented uh, spot which happens. Right. And uh, the picture on the right side, the T-shirt or any abrasive clothing, even that can give pigmentation after you injected bleomycin. Is this permanent or is that, does it uh, heal? It's uh, not recall? permanent. No, it's not permanent. But it is something the patient certainly, it can be I mean, um, uh, extensive and it can stay there. Um, but it is something you want to tell the patient for uh, uh, about it. And there is no, as we were discussing, there is no safe dosage of the bleomycin. Even the smallest dosage can give you the worst fibrosis if possible. Yeah. So what they say about uh, bleomycin actually is that uh, uh, the uh, bleomycin is, although we always felt it was dose dependent that uh, the complication of pulmonary fibrosis sets in uh, it is said to be a very few percentage of uh, people who are actually susceptible to it. So irrespective of what dosage of bleomycin is actually administered in such a patient. So use of bleomycin should be uh, with very much caution. And that is one of the reasons why you have uh, bleomycin in uh, forms like uh, bleomycin gel, where the absorption into the vascularity is much less. So this is... Uh, Another complication which Subhu had sent me. Here, uh, I think it's quite obvious. Uh, you have used a sterosin. Uh, do yes. you remember what sterosin was used? I think it's the same. I mean, it has to be what you get in our pharmacy for the esophageal varices. Right. So it is a, a scleral, scleral all, all those variants. Sodium tetrachyl yeah, sort of yeah. yeah. compounds. Okay. Brands might change. But here, the you see that it's a Cutaneous lesion, same line, same one which you showed, same type of uh, lesion. So you have to be careful, the skin. But luckily, these heal very well, even though they ulcerate, they heal well, but with a scar. So obviously, that's a problem. So use of sterosins uh, must be judicious. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it can be safely used in situations like this, with uh, even though you have a unpredictable uh, ulceration. Uh, I am sure Subhu would have uh, definitely, I mean, if it had not healed, he would have definitely dealt with it by just excising it. and. Usually you know, they heal it. very well. They heal yeah. very quickly. And closing it, uh, you know, uh, without leaving a very obvious scar in position. But there are situations like this, for example, where, uh, uh, you know, you, get, you can end up in uh, disastrous uh, gangrenous uh, necrosis of the pinna. So, Use of sclerosins in uh, terminal portions like the tongue, the tip of the nose, lip, and uh, pinna of the ear should be done with care. Now, this, uh, however, there has been gangrenous, uh, uh, the gangrene of the pinna, mainly because, as you can see here, these are, this is uh, the popescue sutures that they have placed. And these popescue sutures have cut off all the vascularity. In addition, they have also injected... Uh, sclerosins into the pinna and both these have led to uh, total avascularization of the pinna and uh, you end up the patient comes to you with uh, uh, this sort of uh, complication so uh, what would you i mean uh, Srini, do you do you have anything in mind how would you handle a patient with uh, this kind of a complication she was actually 8 months pregnant as well you know which was complicating things further a great company, I mean, you know, to complication to look at, but difficult to manage. But I would see how much of the tissue you would recover. I mean, most of the tissue which is uh, necrosed or uh, the lymphangiomatous, I mean, the super, superficial skin. And even if you get a stump of the cartilage left over, and I would graft it and again, you know, uh, create like microtia treatment or... Uh, uh, reconstruction completely rather than have something which is non-viable. Subhu, uh, any, any uh, feedback on that? 
I would agree. I would uh, remove. You'll have to remove this hemostatic sort of uh, sutures around and yeah. look at it, and then uh, see if it has stopped bleeding. I would uh, be concerned if she's eight months pregnant. Try to see whether she can pass on that period and let it necro. See again, this necrosing things. They don't bleed too much. You need not worry too much if you have an expectant line of treatment. Uh, it might uh, the, you may I don't think there is a meaning uh, you could have a meaningful amount of cartilage remaining there with all these things uh, so I would bit wait remove all these things and wait if at all is not a big problem I would leave it for demarcation and uh, once the pregnancy is over I'll just tide over the crisis otherwise excise it Cover it with a simple no. Don't cover anything. Treat it uh, with uh, you know microtia type of treatment is also difficult. I would um, might be thinking in terms of a implant and prosthetic here later on after excision. No, I will leave it. I will just take it step by step. What happens? Yes, too. Uh, and I think uh, perhaps we we'll do the same. So I think initially to remove the sutures out and carry out an expectant policy. Uh, and I think in our hands we have quite good prosthetics so it's available and we know that somebody who, who hasn't had any underlying bony problems, no radiotherapy, the life on the implant is going to be quite good. Uh, and, and so if by any chance the year necrosis, uh, I, I think we'll go for an implantary training prosthesis. Yeah, so uh, I think looking back, yes, uh, that is one of the uh, you know, options that would have been available, uh, removing the sutures, which we did, we remo removed the sutures, but there was uh, torrential bleeding and then we actually had to uh, resort to uh, uh, excising the, uh, amputating the uh, pinna along with the uh, tissue around it to, because there was a lot of bleeding from not from the, like uh, Subhu mentioned, in the gangrenous pinna was not the one which was the bleeding, but it was from uh, around it that there was torrential bleeding. And so we had to actually ex go around, excise the entire thing and skin graft it. And uh, she is, uh, this is a uh, patient which was operated about six months back. So we are waiting for her to you know, get back to us to do uh, uh, implant rehabilitation. Uh, she's probably fit for uh, a, pro a pinna prosthesis rather than... Uh, anything else. So uh, that would be uh, the way uh, we would progress with this situation. So uh, uh, I think uh, we have come to the end of the session and uh, a quick uh, recap of uh, what we have discussed till now. So uh, I think we have discussed uh, all the possible scenarios, although uh, I think all the panelists will agree with me that there is no such situation as one size fits all. There is no one treatment for all situations, especially in vascular anomalies. Uh, there can be made some sense into how we treat them, which is uh, you identify uh, the biologic uh, nature of the lesion. Uh, you divide it into hemangiomas or into vascular malformations. And as you know, hemangiomas, they tend to proliferate. So well, if they are proliferating too rapidly, you need to treat it. If they are not, you can do benign neglect wait and watch, uh, medical management for rapidly proliferating ones, use of beta, beta blockers, uh, help in uh, involution of rapidly involuting ones. The non-involuting ones, of course, will be left with residual lesions which will need surgical management at a later date. If they are vascular malformation, you identify the dynamics of blood flow. See if they are uh, low flow lesions or if they are high flow lesions. Low flow lesions, uh, ideally you sclerose them, you uh, inject uh, sclerosins or you inject embolic agents into them, or you can use what is known as uh, corset suturing, whereby you collapse the vascular spaces into smaller compartments, which will eventually fibrose. If it's a high flow lesion, vascular control is very important. Endovascular embolization, external carotid control, intravascular em uh, intralesional embolization, all the three can be used. And finally, uh, 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 definitive surgical uh, management is done. So, uh, gentlemen, any closing words, uh, Etu? 
uh, 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 you summarize that quite well. And I think it's <laughs> important to realize that there are lots of other specialities which could have an input into that, and it's best done in a multidisciplinary type setting. There are small lesions which can be managed by individuals, but for larger lesions, a good multidisciplinary type setting will be the best forum to manage them. Subhu? I think it has been uh, quite nice. I summarized that uh, summary slide was correct. And then, yeah, it was um, great. Good. Thank you, Srini. Don't radiate if you don't have to. Yeah, we never spoke about radiation ah, yeah. as a modality of management, which has been mentioned. Yeah. You have to reserve it for uh, elderly people with a bleeding where you can, uh, you know, you have nothing else to do. Otherwise, uh, radiation at a younger age for this vascular lesion, even for uh, the cases you have those, uh, you know, your, um, um, uh, what is that called, juvenile angiofibroma is bad. So, I would reserve radiation only for an elderly person with a vascular tumor to have a hemostatic radiation. Otherwise, no. No, oh, no, is that so? Uh, to the co hosts, uh, if there are any questions, uh, I will quickly take it. Yeah, there are a few questions that we missed. Can we, yeah. can we ask that? Uh, one is uh, uh, there's a question on which vessel was used for the bypass uh, machine? Which vessel was the bypass machine connected to? That was a question for the. Uh, uh, case that Dr. Ayer had done, the, long, oh, the large... Cardiac bypass. Cardiac bypass is done uh, to the aorta cannulation, IJV, uh, you know, the I IVC cannulation. Routine one. Nothing nothing different. Okay. Thank you. And uh, another question again to the second case of Dr. Ayer. Uh, there, uh, there's a question saying, uh, could, uh, you know, the one with the, sub, uh, the facial subunits, uh, yeah. could we take the whole unit out and do the carving and sculpting and re-implant it um, like a, a microvascular uh, reconstruction in one stage. Could that be done? What is your experience? No, no, I, uh, answer is no. Uh, single unit in that case would have been entire nasal uh, dosum could have been a single unit, which would have avoided that uh, difference between the upper vault and the lower vault. Uh, but uh, as a single unit, all these things, no, because the lip was in excess. So naturally, that would have been better to be reduced. Uh, and then sculpting doesn't work in those lip where there are a lot of muscle tissue and all those things. No. But nose, maybe yes. Nasal dorsum. And the columella as a single unit by a good expanded forehead might be... Yeah, might give a better sort of aesthetic appearance. I think it's interesting that question because I uh, asked this to Subhu myself yeah. about uh, total excision and uh, see when you do a total excision, uh, you are uh, devascularizing the entire unit. So uh, trying a microvascular reanastomosis is not going to be very easy in such a pathologic uh, kind of tissue. The second thing is I was asking him whether we could uh, do a face transplant. Face transplant. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, you're this, these are yeah. patients which would, uh, you know, if it was more grotesque and more uh, uh, deforming, whether a face transplant would be a uh, uh, option that one can think of or keep in mind is an arm and armamentarium. Uh, face transplant. Uh, one of the indications have been very bad uh, uh, malformations like neurofibroma or uh, vascular malformation. Huge ones. Yeah. But basic principle is if you it should be done only when the conventional reconstructive methods won't work. Uh, not for a simple thing because the uh, immunosuppression and life-threatening complications that can occur out of the base transplant is, uh, is quite uh, significant. You cannot just do it like that. So uh, it should be done, considered. It can be considered in these lesions uh, or extensive neurofibroma where you know that you cannot do anything other than, uh, you know, and their orifices are closed. You need a tracheostomy, or they are they are functionally so much incapacitated. Their face transplant can be better. Uh, can be considered. Yeah, I think that 
talking about that would be a totally different seminar or a symposium itself yeah. by itself you know <laughs> the moral implication ethical implication yeah yeah correct, correct. Uh, it's a big uh, so uh, i once again thank uh, the panelists so uh, so there was one question one uh, this thing asking if you can touch on dic do you want to do you have time there are a couple of people asking yeah so uh, anybody in the panel wants to address uh, uh, i think uh, i think there can be yeah, possibly a component as such for very very large uh, lymphovenous or venous malformations and sometimes they can be associated with people who have tufted angiomas or hemangio endotheliomas uh, but in general as such it's less common people so can have we... something called lic which is localized intravascular coagulation uh, for large uh, venous malformations so those can present with discomfort uh, and sometimes people talk about using aspirin for this for symptomatic relief but as far as dic is concerned as such it's uh, less common for unless they are syndromic potentially uh, associated with kasabak merit syndrome or something so the, the lesion itself causing a dic would be in uh, one of the schobinger uh, type 4 oh, kind type of situations four. yeah type 4 kind of situations but uh, however interesting you asked that uh, peter because uh, uh, dic is a complication that can be uh, uh, produced as a result of uh, voluminous uh, transfusions that probably uh, sometimes people do if there is a, very very large uh, loss of blood volume and if you have to transfuse more than 10 to 15 units of blood then uh, dic can definitely be a uh, issue there so symptomatic management is the only solution in that kind of situation dr uh, ayer's case the third stage people were asking if it was contraindic it would have progressed from that third stage where it was ulcerating to that area when cardiac output that would have been the schobinger's so i output to... cardiac failure yeah, yeah correct so uh, i think uh, if uh, anybody has any more questions they if they can send it to me by mail okay. that would be preferable i think we are all exhausted there are, yeah. there are a few more questions but i think can be sent to you on mail yeah. yes please so uh, Uh, sn maxfax at the rate of gmail dot com, and if I can't answer it, you know the best people are around with me, <laughs> the panelists. I will direct it to them, and uh, we will somehow be able to give you a solution to your problem. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the viewers. Thank you to the organizers, Pritam, Pramod, Kannan, Amit, the co-hosts, and um, it was really uh, good being part of it. Thank you very much. and good night good evening thank, thank, thank you sir thank you all participants thank you uh, thank you all panelists co-hosts it was a fantastic presentation pramod yeah i'm here yeah, yeah pramod yes yeah uh, i would like to again thank sanjeev sir and all the panelists as well dr ethanandan uh ayer sir srini and uh, dr srikant murthy is not here but i will pass the our uh, thanks to him we work in the same institution uh i i think it was the last yeah will from me pramod are you there was very yeah Pravin, you, yeah sorry yeah. i got, yes. got a call yeah this session is going to be available on youtube for later viewing and if anybody is interested yeah so uh, please log into you... So please log into AMSI yeah, web series yeah, good. on YouTube. Yes, Pramay, come back. Yeah, uh, all the sun co-hosts kindly join us for the uh, debriefing meeting. And the link will be posted in the WhatsApp group. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. We'll end with the AMSI web series music. Please, everybody, please mute and stop your video, please. Pravin, play it. Thank you.